Hi, hello, and welcome to today's video, which will be a complete playthrough of Fear and Hunger 2 Ending A and Ending B with Marina. This video will also be a combination of Let's Play and Lore. My goal will be to show you as much as I can of the gameplay and the world that Fear and Hunger 2 takes place in. And I will also be explaining a lot of the lore, history, and gameplay mechanics as we go along. So why am I using Marina? Well, in my previous playthrough for Fear and Hunger 2, I used Marco and relied mostly on physical attacks. On this playthrough, I wanted to explore more of the magic system. Marina has the very powerful Engrave ability. She can start with one skin Bible and can also start off with some affinity for one of the old gods of your choosing. If Marina can get to Osa in day one and get his skills, she will become an extremely powerful magic user and at times will be able to even break the game. In the second half of the video, I will also be going up against the Heartless One and once having defeated her, I will be switching to using some physical attacks as we go for the Machine God and Rare. I am assuming you haven't seen any Fear Hunger videos, so I will probably also be dropping some Fear Hunger 1 lore and history. Okay, so starting off the game, we have to pick one of eight participants in the Festival of Termina who will be our protagonist. And this is Marina, and I choose regular difficulty for this playthrough. Regardless of what character you pick, the game will start with your character sitting on a train as it approaches Preheville. The game is set in a historical period that mirrors Europe in the 20th century, right at the end of the Second Great War. A war that was started by the Kaiser of Bremen and ended as soon as the Kaiser's forces were able to take Preheville. Here we get Marina's backstory. She was born into the Church of Almer, into a family that practiced the dark arts for many generations. A life of a dark priest is a cruel one, even if modern times overlook the most archaic and ancient rites. A dark priest's life begins and ends in dedication to the old gods. There is no place for self in the church. Your mother had different plans for you. She didn't want you to go down the path that would befall every firstborn son in the church. So when she finally let your father know of your birth, she told him a daughter was born to the household. You were dressed accordingly. Your distant and often absent father didn't get a wind of the original nature of things, or he just denied what was in front of his face. In either case, the subject was never brought up. As you grew a little bit older, you didn't question this either. Everything felt natural this way, so who cares? You grew up at the churchyard in the city of Preheville. You started your religious studies at a fairly young age. You were given an option to choose which studies you would pursue, something completely unheard of if you had been a firstborn son of a dark priest. Studying the occult gives us the engraved skill, which will be useful to get our agility up later on. You proved out to have great talent as an occultist, and slowly even the holy city of the Vatican and their ministry of darkness heard about your feats. You were offered a scholarship at Vatican City to further educate yourself. You took the position without hesitation. Just the idea of getting away from your condescending and stuck-up father was enough to make the decision, not to mention the obvious benefits the Vatican would have to offer. Your hometown wasn't exactly a bustling metropolis. Your mother was very proud of you. She always was. Your father, on the other hand, seemed jealous of you. Your father had always been antagonistic towards you and your pursuits. You were not sure if it had to do with your origin or if there was something else left unsaid. At the Ministry of Darkness, Vatican City, in the initiation ceremony, all the new students would have to choose an older god that they'd let inside of them. Who do you choose? I choose Grogoroth. Everything was going well with your studies until one day you got a letter from home. It was written by your father. This was very strange. You didn't have any contact with him since your departure. 
The letter told that your mother had passed away. The words were very cold and without sympathy. You tried calling your home, but the telephone exchange couldn't connect to any phone in the Preheville area. You had a suspicion that your father had something to do with this. He had always been too obsessed with the blood magic, and you learned that there were too many rites that demanded the blood of your loved ones to work. There was no other way. You had to prepare for a trip back home to Preheville. I choose get something to read in order to collect the skin Bible. The Venushka skin Bible will be very useful towards the end game since it helps unlock some areas where you can collect an armor set that can protect your limbs from dismemberment, which will be useful going up against rare. How long has it been? It feels like it's been a lifetime since you left town. And we are not going to be skipping the intro. Marina falls asleep and has visions of a girl with blue moths. The girl runs away and Marina follows her. You feel like somebody was watching you while you slept. You see other people in the train car, Tanaka and Marco, but they don't wake up. Some pieces of luggage in the train are searchable and have random loot drops that may or may not be very useful. Marina walks into the next train car. Searching the luggage, we find a bear trap. Bear traps are useful for disabling enemies before fighting them. And here we get lucky getting a shotgun. This will be useful to get early access to the city, since instead of getting a bolt cutter or both the keys, you can just shoot the lock at the gate preventing you from entering the city. Marina follows the blue moth and enters the passageway, being teleported to the workshop. Here, she will encounter the very off-putting janitor. He's angry, saying that he's been looking for you everywhere. He asks you if you understand the hurry that they're in. His eyes bulge out of his socket and says that no one expects you to, and then commands you get back to work. Without any explanation or context, and sitting across the way from the little girl from earlier, Rayla, the janitor commands Marina to start constructing replicas of the Cube of the Depths from Fear and Hunger 1. The janitor threatens to rip out Rayla's eyes if she keeps googling him and storms off. The Cube of the Depths was a mystical item in Fear and Hunger 1 that unlocked the ancient door to the lost city of Mahabre, deep underground underneath the dungeon. The ancient city where humans would go to become gods, and where Almer had himself gone to ascend to a higher plane. And it's also where the second half of Fear and Hunger 1 mostly takes place. After assembling a few cubes, the other girl, Rayla, gets up, waves at you, and then runs away. Marina follows her, but she's quickly caught by the janitor. And the first combat encounter begins. Fear and Hunger uses a traditional turn-based RPG combat system. This encounter with the janitor is basically a tutorial that you're not meant to beat, although you can, in which case you would get the Kasara, which is the janitor's weapon, which is pretty decent for starting the game. Right now, with the starting weapon, Marina is applying less than 200 damage points per attack which, as you can see on screen, was not enough to take the janitor down. And next, we have a disturbing scene where the janitor dismembers Marina. Introducing the player to the dismemberment mechanics of the game. Also showcasing the style of body horror that we can expect. With her legs cut off, Marina can only crawl around the workshop now. We don't get too much information about the origin of the workshop, but we get a big hint at the end of the game, suggesting that someone has been meddling with magic and technology. Also, we'll be seeing the style of the workshop again, the improvised wooden style along with the inexplicable machines when we enter the Otherworld regions during the course of the game. 
Marina has a vision. She finds herself in a huge hall populated by giant versions of the different new gods across the eras. We can see Shambara among many others here. All these are the new gods that have failed in their attempts to take down the old gods. Marina has another vision where she finds herself on top of a tall tower with an odd man dressed like a jester waiting for her at the edge. His name is Percola and he would give Marina the first hints of what's going on, explaining that she is a participant in the festival of Termina. Seems to know a lot more than he's letting on and somehow he knows about the workshop and the other visions Marina just had. He says that he pulled you out of the rabbit hole you were crawling down into. And the moon god Rare has healed you and made you whole again. And now you are under the beautiful green hue of the moon, standing on top of the moon tower. Percola explains that he is speaking on behalf of the moon god. Along with Grogoroth, Sylvian, Rare is one of the ancient old gods. And Rare has many agents on earth. You are the dreamer. He is the dream. 14 unwitting participants have been invited and called to participate in the festival of Termina. But, Perkele explains, there will only be one victor in three days time. Marina says that she doesn't want any part in this, but the jester says that's not about what she wants anymore. His master is not giving them the option. The jester says that he doesn't want to confuse you anymore, giving you more information, and that all you need to know is to get to the tower at the center of town. He will answer more questions there. Let's meet again under the moonlight. Disoriented, shocked, and surprised, Marina wakes up and she's back in the train. Everything for a moment looks normal. Before continuing, let's learn a little bit about the city that we will be exploring in this video, Preheville in the region of, of Bohemia. Perheville document. There have been settlements here for as long as the history books cover the area. It has always centered around the mysterious hollow tower that works as a central pillar of the community. The city flourished during the cruel age in the 1600s, but it quickly fell from prominence the closer we got to modern times. I understand the city is medium in size as far as cities in Eastern Europa go. But still, I find it hard to believe that this place would serve as a hub of any kind in a civilized world. For some reason, the government officials insist that Preville keep its capital identity, despite being one of the most remote and unwelcoming cities in all of Bohemia, if not all of Europa. The only explanation I can come up with is that the country is proud of its old archaic rites that still go down in the city and they want to show their full support. If you were to visit Preheville and sightsee a small center, you'd see glimpses of its ancient glory days, still well and alive in these modern days. Do not let the western style shopping districts with its latest movie posters and advertisements fool you. The locals still worship the old world order in the dank and crumbling parts of the city. Ritualistic murder sites are still around the corner no matter where you are in the city. While the churches look dedicated to our one true god Almer from the outside, inside tell a different story. Ancient gods without name in any known language still linger in these crypts. And why wouldn't they? You can hear the priests chant their masses in the moonlight alleys during the dead of night. The whole wicked city is a playground for the ancient beings and the people living there offer themselves to the first taker without a second thought. In the Soldier's Diary, we read, Frankly, I'm baffled at how a city of this size has managed to stay isolated from neighboring influences in modern time. The Preheville folk still hold on tightly to religious rites as old as the fellowship itself. Human sacrifices creep me out in this day and age. Even if I've seen the horrors of war, the crucifixes set around the city manage to send a chill down my spine. Though the train has stopped, and she doesn't see any of the other passengers. Was the janitor, the workshop, the jester, and the moon tower all just a bad dream? Marina makes her way to the front of the train, just like she had in her dream. This couch at the end of the train serves as the first safe spot in the game. Against the far wall, we find a very shaken and scared Japanese businessman, Tanaka. He seems completely lost in his own thoughts, talking about how he's going to be late for a meeting. Marina steps out of the train 
and finds the vast majority of the other passengers. August of Odengard, descendant of one of the four playable characters of Fear and Hunger 1, Corinne, the journalist from Bremen, Olivia, the botanist, Henrik, the chef, Osa, the holy man from the Eastern Kingdoms, and Dan, the doctor. The other participants have already left the train and are making their way to the city. The remaining participants all discuss the dreams they had when they had fallen asleep and realized that they all had the same dream as Marina of being in the workshop with the janitor assembling the cubes of the depth. They start to speculate what could possibly have caused this, some form of military experiment, a collective hallucination? One by one, they introduce themselves to the group, starting with the always friendly Olivia, the botanist from Bremen. She is Rayla's little sister. Rayla is the little girl that we saw at the intro. But while Rayla wanted to study engineering, Olivia was more interested in plants and botany. And as we'll see much later in this video, she can craft extremely powerful poisons out of the local plant life. August and Corinne introduce themselves next, followed by the impetuous chef, Henrik. Henrik then introduces the yellow mage, Osa, who might be the only participant that had a hint of what was to come at the end of this train ride, since he can call upon the wisdom of the great wizard Nasra, whose head he is carrying. And I should add that Nasra does have the filthiest mouth in the entire franchise of Fear and Hunger 1 and 2. And the last one to make his introduction is Dan, the one-eyed doctor in the checkered pants. The blank soul. Poor tragic Dan didn't know that he was someone of interest to the moon god rare and that Pocket Cat was keenly observing him. He continued debating if it was a hallucination or a dream and Corinne exclaims that she thinks it was the Bremen army that did this. The Bremen army which had just recently invaded and took control of Preheville under the Kaiser's command. She accuses Pav, another participant that was wearing a Bremen officer uniform of knowing something about what's going on. Pav had already left and was making his way into the city. And with that, the game proper starts. As part of my strategy for this playthrough, I will have to kill Tanaka to take his soul. The only way to unlock someone's skill tree is by fighting them, killing them, and then taking their soul. If you get Tanaka's soul, you're able to level up your magic defense and agility, both of which I'm planning on using. Starting the combat, I will be targeting his right arm, hoping to take out the limb that he can damage me with. Two attacks, or about 300 damage, should be enough. Tanaka yells out my arm after losing it, and then I'm going to focus all my damage on his torso to finish the fight. I take some damage, but nothing major. For my next turn, I'll have all three ref points so I use them all up so I can get a double enhanced attack against his torso. And that finishes the fight. I do get Tanaka's so, but since I fought him in front of the others, Marco restrains me. And this either ends the game or forces you to skip to the evening of the last day. I learn the value of patience and wait a little bit until Tanaka's further away before attacking him. Talking to Dan shows his scientific mind and how he's trying to comprehend what is happening to them. Dan says that the city is right there, so he's going to go investigate. Throughout the game, we will run into him a few times as he's trying to gather evidence at different parts of the city. And he'll be very helpful once we unlock the bar, since he can make a very good mixed drink. Tanaka leaves the group, and in a way that is in no way suspicious, I follow him in the fog like a house cat hunting a pigeon. There's a couple of houses near the train in the outskirts of the city that I loot just in case they have anything useful. RNG is a big part of this game, so sometimes you get lucky and get a very powerful piece of armor or weapon early on, but most of the time you're just getting consumables to either heal you, feed you, keep you sane, or to cure different status effects. Usually, you'll find rotten meat in this house, which is useful to distract dog type enemies. There's also a lot of really useful wild herbs out here, but you can't pick up most until you have Olivia's botany skills. 
Lavender is useful to soothe you and help you keep your mind meter up. And here we also pass up a couple of groups of wild hemlock which will be very useful once we go for the final bosses at the very end of the game. Continuing on the path north, approaching the city, we get the first signs of the horror that befell the city. We find a ritual circle in a ramshack house and two villagers that were murdered in the violence of the festival. Conveniently, Tanaka makes an appearance, so we attack him. Trying to end the fight faster, I focus all my damage on his torso instead of going for his arm, since I know that his arm and torso have nearly the same health. It would just make the fight a few turns faster. And with that, there's one participant less in the Festival of Termina, and I now have the Latent Soul that I'll be using later on to unlock some skills. And I also have his sweet hat, so I take a moment to put on this, this fine looking hat. If we're going to suffer three days of the horror of this festival, I might as well have a good hat on. Well, at least until I find something better. So we continue on this foggy path approaching the city. We see a house in the fog up ahead. As the rage and violence filled woodman makes an appearance assaulting a villager. While the animation is still playing out, I run into the house to loot it. The woodsman is an iconic enemy because one, he's a very tough early enemy. He can very easily take you down in a few turns. Two. His appearance and his appendage that can jump on you kind of like a facehugger in Alien. And also the entire story between him, his wife and the goat. Although if you look around his house you'll find a lot of these glass shards. You can use a glass shard on an enemy's head in combat and with a little bit of luck you'll be able to blind them. I think these were placed here to give you a chance to go up against the woodsman early on. We find a flyer that tells us that a lot of the locals have been having nightmares or dreams with the same gesture that we had a dream with during the intro of the game. This implies that the old gods had an interest in this area since before we arrived. Having looted the house, I head back downstairs. We'll be back here soon enough to recruit the goat. The goat has a lot of parallels to Moonless. She's an animal type early party member that will attack randomly and that you can't equip with any weapons or armor. And if you're quick, you'll be able to just juke by him without too much trouble. We continue in the forest, entering the Maiden Forest area, where we will find an entrance to the first of the bunkers. We see a dead horse. Fun fact, there are no living horses in either Fear and Hunger 1 or 2, not counting the centaur, because that's not really a horse. Two of these mutated dog enemy types are blocking the path to the first bunker where we will find the first of the telescope stations and also be able to recruit a Bella. These dogs don't pose too much of a threat. You can distract them with rotten meat and then depending on your damage you can generally take them out with one or two attacks to the torso. They don't always attack every turn so it is possible to take them both down without taking any damage. But if luck is not on your side you can take some damage or get poisoned. The first fight went well, so now we fight the second one. I don't have any more rotten meat to distract them, so I just attack and hope for the best. But he does do his poison attack on me, which does inflict the poison status effect, but I did pick up some herbs after we left the train. So I should be fine as long as I don't take too much damage. Fortunately, with a couple attacks, the second dog also goes down. So I just jump into my inventory real quick and use a white vial to cure the poison. Fun fact, for some reason in Fear Hunger 2, you will always find white vials in refrigerators. No idea why. But at least it does make sure that you can always cure yourself from poison. But with all that, we pick up some mushrooms in the area and then head down to the bunker where we will encounter Abella. And also Nito's. I once read a comment about how Abella will usually be in most videos of Fear and Hunger, 
and that's probably because most content creators will usually pick her up early game. She is one, the easiest and the first party member you can recruit. And two, she is very useful. She has the, the wrench toss ability that will be very helpful, especially in the early game. And besides, just having a second character to apply damage early on makes the first parts of the game a lot easier. Also, Abella comes off as super friendly, and who doesn't like that? So together, Marina and Abella descend down into Bunker 7. This is the first of the series of bunkers that the Eastern Alliance built under, underneath Prehevel for reasons unknown. Both the Allies and especially the Bremen Empire were very interested in what was happening and what experiments were being conducted in these underground facilities. These bunkers were underground military facilities that were interconnected and spread across the underground of the city like a spider web. I start looting the shelves and the treasure chest in this area, hoping for something useful. Opening a treasure chest will initiate the coin flip mechanic, where if you get it right, you have a chance of getting an item that might be useful, and if you don't, you might get a lesser value item or nothing at all. In this case, I got the axe, which is a nice upgrade to the knife that Marina starts with. I'm keeping Abella equipped with the wrench so she can use her stun ability. Though the axe is more powerful, it will still pale in comparison to some of the endgame weapons that I'll be using, especially in this run through where I finish the game using the red virtue from the heartless one, which is a parallel to the blue sin, which is a very powerful sword found in Fear and Hunger 1. So blue sin, red virtue. They were both legendary swords forged in ancient Mahabra, the ancient city of the gods. I loot all the shelves in the area, I get some food, a gasoline canister which is useful for combat, a cloth fragment which is useful for healing, another gasoline canister which will also be useful for powering generators that will unlock uh, some doors and elevators. Exploring this part of the bunker, we will encounter one of Fear and Hunger 2 Termina's most iconic enemies, Needles. Needles, along with the Death Mask, are some of the enemies that will pursue you across Prehavil. You can take him down at the very beginning. It is a little bit of a tough fight. So let's see how it goes. Needles came waltzing in to greet you. So I'm going to use the glass shards that I found at the woodsman's house to try to blind Needles so he, that he can't hit me. Using his needle whip, Needles can apply a lot of damage and can take you out real quick at the beginning of the game. In case I miss with the glass shards, I have a Bella toss a wrench at his arm. Hopefully that will stop him from being able to attack me for at least one turn. I had some luck and when he attacked me with his only hand that he could, he still missed. So now I focus attacks on his arms, hoping to be able to stop him from attacking me. I have a Bella re-equip the pipe wrench that she's tossed. Next, Nito does a coin flip attack, and I choose to use a lucky coin in order to increase my odds from 50% to 75%. I have some luck and manage to dodge the attack, and for my next turn, I'm gonna have both Abella and Marina continue attacking his right arm, which I forgot triggers Needles to pull out his handgun. Fortunately, he's still blinded, so he has terrible accuracy. I use up all my ref points, which will give me two attacks per person and both at a higher attack rating, and I concentrate all damage on his torso, trying to drain his HP and finish the fight. He did hit Marina once, so she now has the bleed status effect, so I'm going to use the one cloth fragment that I have to stop her bleeding. For the next turn, I'm just going to continue concentrating attacks on his torso. He should be running out of health soon. I've already applied at least like a thousand damage, so it shouldn't be too much more. But at least this way, we don't have to worry about encountering him once I'm in the city. Fortunately, his being blind is really preventing me from taking a lot of damage. So just rinse and repeat attacking the torso. Looting his body gives me three syringes. And next, I will need to go pour gasoline into the generator, which will power the elevator, which allows me to go one level deeper. And that's where I'll find the telescope station 
and get teleported to the other world. I don't really need to do the other world section, but there are a lot of loot containers, which can be useful in the beginning of the game. And once you can deal with the Ron Trails, you can get a lot of uh, rust color pearls here, which you can use for trading with one of the old gods if you have the portrait of the young man and you make an offering with it. I find some head armor and have a Bella equip it. Of the participants in the festival, Abella is the only one from Odengard, which is the same town that we saw in the flashback where you fight the skin granny in Fear and Hunger 1, the town that Legard raided to get the cube of the depths. And Marina is one of the only two Prehevel natives along with Levi, the child soldier. Since Abella has a lot of experience with electronics, she is able to hack these doors. If you have small keys, these paths will lead you to the sewers, but also connect to another bunker that has an exit into the slums. But right now, my goal is just to loot. There are several treasure chests around here that might drop something that makes my run a little bit easier. Bella again short circuits another lock that gives me access to this closet. I find a gasoline canister and a couple of crafting items used with Abella's weapon craft skill to make some custom weapons, but I won't be using that until the very end of the game. And here's a little Lord Tibbet. Needles that we just fought is believed to be Dan's father-in-law, having been resurrected after dying, performing a ritual to the old gods. Both Dan's father-in-law and fiancé died in the ritual while he was away at the war, having been drafted into the Bremen army. All the participants' stories can be a little bit sad, but in particular, Dan and Levi's backstories, I think, are among the saddest. On the other hand, of Bella, I think you can make the argument that she has the least tragic backstory. Her story is mostly about her volunteering on the home front, helping the war effort, and getting involved in the espionage between the different powers. Ending up joining the rebel group NLU, the Nameless Liberty Underground, who sent her on a mission to Prehavel to meet some local contacts. Fortunately, I found a light blue vial in the treasure chest, which is extremely useful since Marina was at only one health point left. Having looted everything, I turn around and go back. I still need to activate the teletroscope station that I'm going to need to have activated for ending A. I take the elevator down one level. And here we will see another vision of Rayla, Olivia's sister, that was involved with the secret research going on in these bunkers. She is leading us to the teletroscope station. But before following her, I make sure to loot everything in this area. Again, using a Bella's short circuit scale to get past these doors. I have some luck and I find some 12 gauge shells for the shotgun, along with the fact that I already have a trench gun means that I can now make my way into the city. I don't need to go to the mayor's house. I lose this coin flip, but I find nothing in the chest. But in the shelf next to it, I did find a saw blade, which I will need to make the meat grinder at the very end of the game. The bunkers usually have a lot of crafting components for the weapons that Abella can craft using her weapon craft skill, which can give you some extremely powerful weapons very early on in the game that can apply different status effects like fire and poison. The meat grinder, you need one specific component that's only found in a few different locations across the game and it's not the easiest component to find, which is the bench grinder. We find a letter on the dead soldier it reads, Dear Gisela, I write this letter in great sadness. I'm afraid I'll have to postpone my return to your loving bosom. Even if the great war is supposedly over, our tasks seem anything but. After running around following orders that would sicken every sane person who had not witnessed the horrors of war, I think I finally started to see the red line our Kaiser has been following all along. This rotten city was the very thing our Kaiser strived to conquer since day one. I do not think it is a coincidence that very soon after reaching the city, the Kaiser decided to withdraw Bremen forces elsewhere and agree on the terms of peace. I don't know what's so special about this miserable place, 
but I even heard that the Kaiser himself will be coming here in the upcoming days. Maybe after that, I can finally return home. I hope you are able to wait for me just a little bit longer. Signed, yours forever, Joni. So here we learn that 1. The Kaiser started the entire war just to take over this one unremarkable city and 2. That the Kaiser should be in the city of Perheville before long. Next to the dead soldier is a massive piece of equipment with wiring running down the tunnels going into the darkness. We get a message that says, Connecting one before another does not cause any damage to the system, but it should not be done without clear orders from the designated official in charge of the operation. So we turn on the telescope station that's connected to the logic and the machine starts vibrating and humming. In the room next over, we find a ritual circle with the sigil of Rare on it. Rare sigils will transport you to the other world. We search the bookshelf and get some luck. We find the skin bible of Rare. Now we can go back to the woodsman's house and recruit the goat. We enter the other world, which is a corrupted or distorted version of whatever physical area we are in. So here we just saw a corrupted version of the telescope machine. This part is fairly straightforward. I'm going to keep my distance from the monsters, try to loot everything, and then find my way out back to the surface so I can continue with the game. As long as you stay away from the Rontrells, they do not activate and just leave you alone. It's also worth noting that the construction materials and the look of this area is the same as the workshop where we encounter the janitor during the intro of the game. The function of these areas mirrors the Otherworld sections in Silent Hill a lot, being corrupted versions of the area that you're in. The reason that we need the skin bible of Rare to recruit the goat is that to recruit the goat you first need to talk to the man in black. The man in black can only be found by drawing the Rare sigil in the ritual circle in the basement of the woodman's house. With the goat and Abella's help, Marina should be able to manage herself pretty well with the early and mid game enemies entering into the city. A golden gate can be found here. The golden gates are a fast travel system connecting some of the otherworldly regions to each other and can only be accessed if you have the golden gate skill for which you need a high enough affinity with rare. And with that, it's time to skedaddle, go back to the regular world, and get a breath of fresh air. Exiting the bunker, we encounter Pav, one of the other participants. He's dressed like a Bremen army officer. He says, you made it out alive. And then he introduces himself as Lieutenant Pav. Although at a glance, looking at his uniform, it doesn't seem like he's wearing it to regulation. He says he recognizes you from the train and asks you to introduce yourself. Then he tells you to be on your best behavior. He creepily says, I like your style. Would be very interesting seeing what's under that dress of yours, my young lass. He says that he takes it that you found one of the keys to the city, although we won't be using them since we have the shotgun. But we do have one of the two keys needed to unlock the gate to the city. The other key is being held with the mayor. The Bremen lieutenant says that he would have gotten the key himself, but he didn't want to go underground. Besides, the festival is only at its beginning. I don't want to do anything too risque yet. He then tells us to be a good kid and get the gate open to the city. Pav says that he's got some other business to attend and takes his leave. Okay, so now we have a Bella with us, a shotgun shell, and we also have the skin bible for rare that we can now go use to recruit the goat, along with a collection of smaller drops. Abella mentions that she thinks that Pav knows more than he's letting on, but that's probably because she suspects the Bremen army is behind the weird happenings here in Preheville. She also speculates that the tunnels underneath Preheville are why the Kaiser started the war and why the war ended as soon as the Bremen army took over. So Abella mentions that there must be more to what's going on here and underneath the soil. She then mentions that she didn't find any parts for the train and that's probably better if you two stick together. And now we make our way back to the woodman's house. This time I'm going to use some of the shotgun shells that I found to take them down. 
but should make him trivial and allow me to safely enter and exit his house, recruiting the goat. Equipping the shotgun for the first time, we get a message about how alien and weird it feels for Marina to hold a firearm like that. After two shots, the woodsman goes down. I search him for the basement key that I need to get access to where I can use the sigil of rare to talk to the man in black which will allow me to recruit the goat. So those are the requirements to recruit the goat at the beginning of the game. You need the basement key to get to the basement, the skin bible of rare to write the sigil on the ritual circle that takes you to where you can speak to the man in black. You also need a piece of chalk to draw the sigil. So with the key in hand, I'm able to get past the chains blocking my way to the basement. In a way very reminiscent to the chains on the front door of the apartment in Silent Hill 4, the room. The goat can be big help in the early game since he's an additional party member that can do more damage. But he has a few shortcomings. One, you can't direct his attack. So every turn that he attacks, he will attack a random part on a random enemy. Sometimes it's useless when he takes out a limb on an enemy you're already taking out by attacking the torso, but sometimes he does go for the head and deliver a one hit kill to random enemies. He also can't equip armor or weapons, so as the game goes on, he loses effectiveness. Searching the shelf, we find an article about the Great War. It reads, it's a week old article about the ending of the Second Great War. Two of the biggest powers in the Western world, the Eastern Union and the Bremen Empire, settled for peace after the last aggressive push by the Bremen troops, happening just days prior to the treaty. The Bremen troops seized power in a small city of Preheville, located in central Bohemia, just west of Lake Verdete. The last push was considered especially aggressive and is widely considered to have advanced the peace agreements on a larger scale. Another major factor behind the peace was the joint assaults against the Eastern Union on both the Western and Eastern fronts. From the West, the remnants of the Kingdom of Rondon kept attacking the Eastern Union, and from the East, the Kingdom of Edo continued their campaign after prior defeats. The article goes on and on with details, but that seems to be the gist of the article. Continuing to search the room, we read the book in the corner, but it's just random notes from a madman, nothing legible. Investigating the old woman, we see that she has a note about reuniting with her lover on the other side, which we know is the goat, or the man in black. Marina draws the sigil of rare on the ritual circle on the ground and is teleported to the otherworldly version of the woodman's house. We don't find much in this part of the other world, except for a solitary figure just standing waiting for visitors here. In what appears to be a traveler's leather outfit, we find a man in black. Speaking to him, he says, another one heeds my call. Just remember that you came to me, not the vice versa. Tell me, O oh naive one, do you believe in the pitch black darkness? Marina responds, I live in and for darkness. Truly? The True darkness is such a gift. There is no light without a shadow. Good can come from bad places, just as bad can come from good. A constant struggle, a game even. This is how it's meant to be. That is how it was. A man listened to his spirit, and you could tarnish that spirit so easily. But it wasn't to last. Then people started worshipping a new god. The god called the science. Suddenly, everything needed to be calculated before putting into consideration. There is no good or evil behind the scope. Maybe my time has come to lend a sword again. I'll aid you in your quest. I'll see you soon. And with that, the mysterious man in black disappears into thin air. Having spoken with him, we leave the other world and go back to the woodman's house. Exiting onto the porch, we see that the goat has changed location, and if we speak with him, he seems to be following our every move more attentively. You ask it to join your party, and he agrees. So Marina now has two companions in her party making things a little bit easier, and keeping her company in this spooky city. We continue our journey into the city of Preheville, 
approaching the outskirts, which would be the slums. The first area we encounter were where we will find the lock gate leading to the city center. Working their way through the fog, approaching the old run-down houses of the slums of Preheville, you hear distant screams and ramblings. You are not alone. The center of town is quiet, still, and devoid of life. An area once teeming with life, now destroyed with the festival of Termina and the chaos that came with it. As the old gods played games with the lives of humans. Past the public toilet, we find a crucifixion site, a symbol that the religion of the old gods and their worship is still alive in these ancient parts of the earth. Our heroes are charged by a village woman holding a knife in each hand, her face disfigured by moon scorching. Fortunately, there are three people in our party, so that should help make it out of the encounter, hopefully without too much damage. Marina attacks one arm, Isabella uses the wrench toss ability to take out the other one. The goat attacks one of the legs, and with that, the fight should be wrapped up since now the villager has a very limited ways of attacking me. From here on in, I'll just focus all damage on the torso, and the fight should be done in a couple more turns. Marina takes a little bit of damage from the tackle, but nothing serious. With both her legs cut, the villager loses her balance and now the head is vulnerable. To which Marina delivers 900 points of damage, which is completely unnecessary, but hey, why not a crit to the head to end the fight? Before long, a sickle villager makes his way towards us. This is one of the enemy types that can be resurrected as a ghoul. He has a sickle that he can use to inflict a bleed status effect, which is annoying, but easy to get rid of. He can also drop a bear trap, which triggers a coin flip, which, if lost, will sever your legs, which is a headache at this point of the game. Later on in the game, limb loss is a little bit easier to manage when you have the skin bible of Sylvian, which will allow you to refill your health and regenerate any ailments and limb losses. The fight with the sickle villager is over quickly. I again used Abella's wrench toss ability defensively to stun his attack arm. Marina enters the nearby rundown house to explore, searches the bookshelf, but everything has already fallen apart. Marina continues to explore the old rundown house. Everything has been ramshackled and tossed around the rooms. Before long, another knife villager charges our party, ambushing them from the dark. And her crazed pathfinding abilities are not very good, as you can see. Eventually though, the combat encounter does start. Since she charged me, the fight starts with a coin flip, which fortunately we win using a lucky coin. The fight starts, and unlike last time, I won't be attacking the arms, but I focus all attacks on the torso, and I'm able to finish the fight in one turn. I search the corpse and find a small key, which will be useful since I don't have anybody in my party with the lock pick ability yet. Searching the house, we find some moldy bread, which is actually useful since it does fill up a nice bit of your hunger meter. On the second floor, we find a chest, which triggers the coin flip, which I lose, so I don't find anything. And that makes me sad. We head back downstairs to continue searching the house, and eventually the basement. The basement in this house is notable, since it has a ritual circle, which will eventually be able to host a blood portal, which is one of the game's fast travel systems, and makes traveling back and forth a lot easier. Searching the bookshelf, we find the Alchemia Volume 2, which unlocks some advanced potion crafting recipes. Unlocking the basement door, we head back into the center plaza of the slums. Before entering the city, I'm going to want to loot the other parts of the slums just to make sure I have the best start possible with all the healing items, consumables, and any weapons or armor that I might drop. I casually walk by the sickle villager, make my way to Old Town where you have to cross through this open basement door. You get a message saying that the air feels like it's getting heavier and heavier. Entering the basement, the air down here is heavy, moist, and musky. 
Exploring the back end of this basement, we find a lucky coin, which is always useful to have, some shillings and a blue herb, which are also nice additions. Marina finds a chest and we win the coin flip, which gets us the rifle. The rifle allows us to apply damage to monsters in the over map. Basically, it allows you to soften them up or outright kill them without having to fight them. And that way they can't hurt you. But ammo can be limited at times, but it's really useful for those specific battles that are very difficult that you want to avoid. Marina wraps up looting this area and then gets followed by a pipe villager. But once you have two people in your party, when you're fighting the villagers, you can usually just focus all damage on the torso and be done in one turn. The pipe villager is tougher than the knife and sickle villager, but I get lucky and get a critical strike and that's enough damage to take him out. Searching the chest, I fail the coin flip and get nothing. We're going to be talking about the gods, old and new, a lot in this video, and I'll be referring to them over and over again. So let's learn a little bit about the gods first before moving forward. Gorgoroth, the destroyer of man, is the god of destruction and human sacrifice. He wishes for blood to be spilled in his name. Gorgoroth is a curious name, more so than any of the other older gods. To relive the feeling of fear, he wears the bodies and skins of the men and women alike. Some believe he still walks among men, masked under the skin of people and hanging bodies. His presence is fading from the world. Sylvian, the goddess of love and fertility, created men and women at the dawn of time. She wishes only for an act of love in her name, granting you a bond more serious than you could imagine. Both Sylvian and Grogaroth originated from the green hue on the plane of the older gods. Many believe that she left mankind a long time ago. The God of the Depths, an old and gigantic being worshipped by the outcasts in the darkness, insects and wretched soulless beings. Its body lies dormant in the altar of darkness, and within it there is the gauntlet, a way to the very bottom of the dungeons. They were killed, and their body used as a vessel to give birth to the God of Fear and Hunger. Vinushka. Vinushka is the god of nature, and the offspring of Gorgoroth and Sovian. It is said that Vinushka's appearance can change according to the region of the world that the deity decides to appear in, just like nature itself, and with a temper that is as volatile as the manifestations of their domains. Rare, the trickster moon god, is one of the last old gods to still observe mankind. He is a jealous kind, and would not share godhood and the world order with humans and the new gods, because he doesn't believe men should have the same rights as true gods. He has many ploys to diminish the influence of the new gods, but his motivations seem uncomprehensible to them. The Lady of the Moon and Pocket Cat are his servants, both bent on killing children as a way to get rid of humanity's potential ascension. After the older gods left mankind, the kingdoms of the world were slowly rotting away, and the grand values mankind once aimed for were displaced by defiled practices and principles. Without the guidance of the older gods, and in times of great peril, Almer, the in-world stand-in for Jesus of Nazareth, except that after his crucifixion and resurrection, he didn't forgive or forget. He led his disciples on the mission of revenge. And the book on the pedestal explains that this is an, an imperfect ritual circle used to present offerings to the new gods such as the Heartless One, the Radiating One, or the Tainted One. We'll be back to this one before too long. We briefly encounter Levi, who runs away, and since I have a bone saw, I collect the villager's head, which I'll need to offer to the Tainted One for Soulstone Shards, which is useful for unlocking skills. We head back outside and loot all the boxes, find some pep pills, which are actually a very powerful buff, since they can give you an extra action per turn in fights. I make my way to the mayor's mansion. The mayor won't have spawned yet, and I won't be able to get the second key to the gate to the city from him yet, since he doesn't spawn till the afternoon of day one, and I'm still on the morning of day one. But there is some good loot here, especially the library, where I'm hoping to get some skin bibles, specifically the skin bible of Sovian, which I do find, the skin bible of the god of fear and hunger, to get the agility buff using the engrave skill, and the skin bible of Almer, so I can start setting up blood portals. I make my way upstairs to continue looting, and also 
because there is a secret other basement that will have a piece of armor that's useful this early in the game. Looting, I find some 9mm bullets and the ring of still blood, but if I don't have any accessories equipped, might as well, since it has the power to stop the bleed effect from being inflicted on you. After the morning of the first day, you'd find the mayor here, or the gentleman. In the morning of day one, if you do not recruit a Bella, you can also find Henrik here, and if you snap him out of the trance that he's in, he can actually become a recurring source of infinite food throughout the rest of the game. But I decided to recruit a Bella, since having her in a party makes the early game so much easier. Also, I just like a Bella. She's cool. Entering this room here, we encounter the first decrepit priest that we'll see on our journey. I put some distance between him and me and equip the rifle that I picked up a little bit ago and shoot him a few times to make the fight with him a little bit easier. So now, when the fight starts, he won't have either of his arms, meaning that he can't cast some spells on me, which can be pretty damaging in the beginning of the game. Especially the spell hurting that he can cast on you, which can take a limb from you. So I focus all damage on his torso, which has 875 HP, so it should take one or two turns to kill him. The decrepit priest smiles in an extremely creepy and unsettling way. I do not like this man's smile. I keep attacking his torso and right now he can only do tackle attacks, which aren't too bad and fortunately that one missed. So one more round of attacks on his torso is going to finish the fight. I search the priest and I get lucky and find a soul stone, which is the item that you use to unlock skills at a hexen table. I also take his head as a trophy to later trade for more soul stone shards to unlock even more skills. In the back room, Marina finds a ladder down a level, leading to some secretive rooms. Here I'll find a chest the manor key, which unlocks a few doors in this house, and a piece of leather armor, which is better armor than the starting armors. Equipping the leather armor takes my defense from 19 to 26, so a nice little jump. I start to make my way back, though I will be back here once I start putting together the fluted armor, which I'll need for the end game since it can protect you from limb loss. I use the manor key to get access to the basement. Down here, you can find the food storage of Old Town. For some reason, all the refrigerators in Preheville will have a white vial, which is a very useful item because it removes the poison status effect. If you snap Hendrik out of his trance and lead him down here, that's when you'll be able to get the unlimited food supply from him. I leave the mayor's mansion and continue looting the slums for any items that might be useful. We encounter a sickle villager here, but now we know that with the party that we have, he shouldn't present too much of a problem. So same tactic as before, focus attacks on the chest, and in one turn, the fight's over. I loot him and collect his head. I keep looting and find the shotgun shell, which is always useful. Nearby, there's a dead body of a soldier. Searching it, we find a diary entry. Dear Gisela, I write this letter in great sadness. I'm afraid I will have to postpone my return to your loving bosom. Even if the great war is supposedly over, our task seems to be anything but. After running around following orders that would sicken every sane person who had not witnessed the horrors of war, I think I finally started to see the red line our Kaiser has been following all along. This rotten city, it was the very thing our Kaiser strived to conquer since day one. I do not think it is a coincidence that very soon after reaching the city, the Kaiser 
decided to withdraw Bremen forces elsewhere and agree on the terms of peace. I don't know what's so special about this miserable place, but I've heard that the Kaiser himself will be coming here in the upcoming days. Maybe after that, I can finally return home. I hope you are able to wait for me just a little longer. The letter is signed, Yours Forever, Joni. Tragically, this soldier, Joni, is as dead as this beaten horse over here. Rest in peace, Joni and horse. Entering this house, we find a secretive ambush. There are two villagers here, but as long as you don't step on the glass, they won't be able to hear you and won't attack. So you just have to be careful and walk around the glass and these two bear traps, and you'll be able to make it through just fine. Exiting the building, we enter a small little courtyard with some crates and barrels to loot, but also a couple of bear traps. We find a pipe that's useful for smoking opium or tobacco to refill mine, and some rotten meat which the goat will eat. Continuing to explore Old Town, we'll find a few more areas to loot, and we also run into the first ghoul of this run. We're going to fight the ghoul since I'm going to need his head as a trophy to get more skills. And we use the same tactic as with the villagers. Just concentrate all damage on the torso. They don't have too much health, so the fight can be over in one turn. Searching him, we find some tobacco, which is always nice to have, and we take his head as a trophy. So now with the rest of the slums, we get to a very interesting moral conundrum that Fear and Hunger 2 presents us. To get both endings solo, I'm going to need a lot of skills. And to unlock skills, you need soul stones. One of the easiest ways to get soul stones is to trade trophies or heads for soul stone shards. And then for every three of those, you can craft a soul stone. So basically what I'm saying is that if you want to get a lot of skills in Fear Hunger 2 Termina, you're gonna need a lot of heads. And in the slums, there's a lot of moon scorched villagers that won't attack you that you can, well, euthanize to put it lightly. So this is the part where I lie to myself and I tell myself that I'm putting them out of their misery for their own good, not for my selfish purposes. This part gets a little bit repetitive, so in the interest of time, I'm just gonna fast forward a little bit here. Nearby in this shack, there's a latch that leads underground to a part of the underground bunker system. Down here, we can get a little bit of loot. There's a path to the sewers and also a classroom where if you have the film, you can see the video of a regular person being moon scorched and being turned into a bobby. Abella's short circuit skill is going to be useful here to get through the doors. Exploring this area, we'll find some items, some crafting components, the path to the sewers that we don't need quite yet, a chess, but I failed a coin flip and don't really get anything out of it and not too much else. So after unlocking the door, in case I make my way back here from the sewers, I return to the surface. On the surface, I get to my power leveling tactic that I mentioned earlier involving the Moon Scorched Villagers and the heads that they do not need anymore. So I continue my purge and finish up in the slums and loot everything. Then I'll start heading into the city of Prahavel proper. And with that, I've collected all the heads in the slums, which will be extremely useful once I start unlocking skills in mass. Making our way back, we encounter Corin in the little courtyard area with the bear traps. Speaking to Corin, she asks what the hell is going on in this town, and she mentions that she's been attacked by the locals and is glad that she has her pistol with her. 
she is still chasing a story or a scoop. She insists that she is working alone. She'll be a welcomed addition to the party when we recruit her on day two, since she has the lock picking skill. A fun fact about Corinne, she often gets made fun of since she used the phrase, I've covered wars, you know. This happens at the very beginning of the game when the participants are huddled outside the train discussing what's going on. The reason it's funny is that the Great War just ended and covered the entire continent, meaning that pretty much every journalist of this time has covered war. And to make it worse, she tells that to two different war veterans. Dan and Levi both saw service during wartime. So her saying that she's covered wars just seems out of place, like it's not really a brag. Anyway, just a fun little fact that always amused me. On my way back to the lock gate that leads to the city, I deliberately step on the glass and take out these two villagers for the same reason as the others to collect their heads to get soul stones. So now let's head back to the basement with the imperfect ritual circle and see how many soul stone shards we get from the tainted one. We sacrifice the 14 heads we've collected so far as the tainted one slowly rises from a pool of blood. Unbearable existence, the suffering, the agony. We play the secret song that echoes from within. The sound that is like razors through flesh. Can you hear it? Yes, you can hear my voice after all. Ask and thou shalt receive. So for our hard work performing mass decapitation, we get 14 soul stone shards, which will give us four soul stones. The air got lighter again. It feels like a burden off of your shoulders. On our way back, we encounter a pipe villager. Pipe villagers are the ones that have more HP and are a little bit tougher than the sickle and knife villagers. So this time, the monster lives long enough to deploy a bear trap. Once the bear trap is deployed, you have one turn before you have to do a coin flip. But fortunately, we're able to take out the villager before it gets to that. Searching him, we find a severed arm and leg. I'm not really sure what is the purpose of severed limbs other than there is a spell that deals more damage with the more limbs you have in your inventory. In Fear and Hunger 1, if you had enough limbs, you could unlock the Sergo Spear in the laboratory underneath the streets of Mahabre. But in Fear and Hunger 2, you get the Sergo Spear simply by advancing the plot, as you encounter Rancid the Sergo after you collect the three effigies and unlock the path in the Church of Almer. As we enter the Old Town Plaza, the Vial starts to pursue us. The Vial is a weird man whose pig mask has fused to his head and cannot be removed. He attacks you with his pesticide tank and wand, spraying poison at you and beating you with the tank. Fortunately, hitting him with the shotgun before the fight weakens him before fighting him. After destroying his arms, I again focus all damage on his torso. I unequip the rifle from Arena since using it at this point would just be a waste of ammo. The Vile is one of the stronger enemies that we'll find in the slums, so taking him down takes a little bit more time. And next, I equip the shotgun, which I'm going to use to blast the lock off of the gate and enter the city. If I hadn't found the shotgun and ammo, I would have had to enter the city through the sewers since I'm trying to get to the Church of Almer on the morning of day one. My goal is to encounter Osha as fast as possible. Something interesting about Fear and Hunger 2 is the way in which you can power up your character is almost exclusively through engaging in violence. So, so far we've been collecting trophy heads in order to trade for soul stones, but in order to unlock the skills, in order to be able to use the soul stones, you need to collect the souls from the other participants in the festival, meaning you have to hunt them down and kill them. So I'm hunting Osha down in the church in order to unlock the Spice Forge skill, which will be essential for the build that I'm going for on this run with Marina. Here we encounter Levi, who, along with Marina, is the only other Prehevil native 
of the participants of the Festival of Termina, Marina sees that the boy is avoiding your eye contact as best as he can. You notice shot marks on the bend of his arm. Looks like he's been injecting something. Levi is an orphan that was drafted by the government to be a child soldier in the war. After completing his duty, he has returned to Preheville, hoping to be able to rebuild something of a life for himself. And unknowingly, he has ended up being a participant in the Festival of Termina. Also in the basement of the restaurant, we find these casks filled with wine that you can use to fill up any empty flask that you have with some wine that will help fill up your mind meter. Also down here we find a carrot. Carrots are important because eating well and taking care of your health is very important and vegetables are part of a complete diet. I use a small key to get access to this locked room and I'm able to get another lucky coin from underneath this shelf and a gasoline canister which is useful to have for combat encounters. In combat, you can toss the gasoline canister and then attack it to apply fire damage to all enemies. I finish looting the restaurant's basement and leave. Entering Preheville, we encounter one of the more, in my opinion, annoying enemies, the Bobbies. They can do a lot of damage and are very resilient. Bobbies are moon-scorched police officers that patrol the center of the city looking for and attacking any survivors they encounter. Since I don't want to fight them quite yet, I'm able to sneak by them and run away, which is not a bad tactic at the beginning. I take a right at the intersection to make my way to the church. Entering central Preheville, I'll have to contend with another Bobby along with a rifleman that's perched on top of a car shooting at anybody that he sees coming by. I clumsily bump into a bobby and need to fight him now. At the start of the combat, we can see that the bobby has three different arms that he can use to attack me, along with his quickly spinning head. This is what I meant when I said that the bobby can apply a lot of damage. I only have two characters whose attacks I can direct. So I direct them to try to destroy as many of the arms as I can, trying to minimize how much damage he does to me. Fortunately, the remaining arm misses. In the next turn, I take out his last arm and start attacking his torso. He does have more HP than the villagers, so two attacks aren't enough to kill him. Since they've been moon scorched, the bobbies have regenerative abilities, so they will continue to spawn more arms with batons as the fight progresses making the fight tedious and harder than with the villagers, since when you disarm the villagers, they weren't able to respawn any limbs. Fortunately, both Marina and Abella have three ref points, which I use to get two attacks and stronger attacks. As the next turn starts, the Bobby regenerates his limbs again. So again, I target his arms, trying to stop him from being able to attack me. This constant process of having to target the arms over and over again really drag out the battle and give the bobby more chances to attack you. But eventually, we apply enough damage to put him down. Since bobbies can regenerate, after fighting them, you have to beat them. Otherwise, they'll stand back up and attack you again after a small amount of time. Next, I'm going to run down the street and take out that rifleman taking shots at me. The rifleman is like the other villagers. He's unarmored and not too strong. The only advantage that he has is that he can shoot at you from afar. But fighting him, it's pretty easy to take out his rifle and then like the other villagers, damage his torso till he's down. I initially thought that the Rifleman was wearing a laboratory jacket, but it seems like the fan theory is more that it's simply a trench coat, which was a more normal fashion in the time periods that Fear and Hunger 2 Termina draws inspiration from. Walking the streets of Preheville, we loot the chests and the containers, but we can also see that the streets are in complete disarray, vehicles chaotically parked everywhere, barricading the streets, coffins everywhere, giving us a hint of what happened to the local inhabitants of Preheville. 
The bookstore is an important location in downtown Perheville since it has a save point and you can also open a blood portal here. This is also one of the locations you would have to visit to recruit Marina if I wasn't playing as her. The sign says no entry, staff only, but I decide to live dangerously and break the rules. A presence of a ritual circle here means that the bookstore owner might have been interested in the occult. Which is not surprising since we know that the old tradition and the old ways still have very strong roots in this area of Bohemia. Once I'm done looting, I start heading back to the streets. But on the first floor, I run into the bobby that was patrolling there. The police officer seems determined to catch you. As combat starts, he yells out for justice and order. I repeat the same tactics as we used with the previous bobby. I'm going to prioritize taking out his arms and then when I have an opportunity, apply damage to his torso. My goal is to take him down while limiting the damage he can apply to me. In the next turn, he spawns two arms again, which I prioritize trying to protect my HP. You might have noticed I'm not using Abella's wrench toss ability. That's because the Bobby's arms are weak enough I can take him out with one hit. And by using regular attacks instead of wrench tosses, I don't have to spend one turn re-equipping the wrench. The Bobby's head has stopped spinning, making it vulnerable. So I take him out using a rev powered up attack. And after fighting him, I'm sure to beat him because I don't want any surprises later. Wrapping up looting the bookstore, I head back out to the street and continue making my way east towards the Church of Ulmer. As is customary, I loot everything and I'm also able to find a lucky coin in a back alley. This might be a good time to point out that Preheville both the name and the architectural style of the city is modeled after the city of Prague in the Czech Republic. We see more and more containers and vehicles just thrown around blockading the streets. It makes you wonder if the Bremen army was hunting down rebels here and if this maze became a trap for the civilians trying to survive the festival of Termina once the violence broke out everywhere. We also see a sewer hole here, but I can't open it since I don't have the sewer winch yet. The sewer can be a very convenient way to sidestep or dodge a lot of the obstacles of navigating the surface of the city. Heading north up this alley, we get the first glimpse of the king in yellow and one of his guards as they make their way towards the museum. The king in yellow is Lagarde from Fear and Hunger 1. 600 years in the past, he is still continuing on his quest to fight and take down the old gods in any way possible. Marina gets a feeling that the streets feel almost too quiet, even for an abandoned town. As we approach the Church of Almer, I did want to say thank you very much for spending this time with me and watching my video. I do appreciate it and it, it is a big help. If I could possibly bother you, to hit the like button or just leave a comment, really anything helps, I'd appreciate it. And I do hope this video is making your day a little bit better as you work, study, do chores, or whatever. But anyways, back to this horrifying and gruesome game. Approaching the Church of Almer, we get a glimpse of Rancid the Sergo cleaving a bobby clean in half and then jumping away, making his escape on the church rooftop making him, Rancid, and August the only two parkour capable characters in Fear Hunger 2 Termina. We've arrived at the church and enter looking for Osa. As per usual, I loot everything. Fun fact, if you look to the stained glass window to the right, you'll see one of the three panels in the church. That one's called the Fellatio of Humanity. You can see the relative positions of Almer and the human on his knees in front of him. To make this even funnier, think about the only interaction you can have with the body of Almer in Fear and Hunger 1, and the fact that Almer is the Christ figure of this universe. But anyway, moving on, we loot the rest of the church and then head over to encounter Osha and his mean prank in the confession booth. But first, on the way, we loot the craftman's stash to get the bolt cutters 
they're just useful to have. And we get a bottle of vodka, which never hurts. Well, I guess it would hurt the next day if you drink it all. We find some dirty toilet paper in the church. That is a fun sentence to say. And a soul stone, which is far more useful and valuable than dirty toilet paper. And next, we enter the confession booth to have the encounter with Osa, where he pretends to be a priest and take your confession. An overwhelming aura fills the air as you sit down to the confessional. The claustrophobic little box creates an atmosphere of condemnation and spite. Marina says, Forgive me, father, for I have sinned. I've been a bad girl. Okay, no, she doesn't say that. A deep voice replies, Is that so? And then the deep voice asks, What are the most vile and despicable acts that you have done? As I'm sure it's standard for all priests to ask. So that Ulmer may absolve your sins, of course, said the deep voice. Marina debated what to reply. She chooses to say that she's lusted for someone she shouldn't have. Because why not choose the one that sounds like it belongs in a soap opera? The deep voice replies, jumping straight to the juicy bit I see. Good, good. The deep voice asks if it's someone else from the train ride. Very important information, you see. Marina replies, yes, how did you know? Interesting. Does she have red hair? Yes, Marina replies. Because why not add pointless romantic drama? The voice asks, could this be forbidden love? But why is this lust condemned? Because we live in a society, replies Marina. Are you sure about this? Sometimes people can be more open than what old taboos would lead you to believe. Of course, sometimes people can act out of fear of the unknown and condemn everything that is alien to them. And sometimes you're the one who is wrong. Not all things should be experimented with and not all taboos need to be pushed. You won't know what is the case before you proclaim your love out in the public. I know this is not a pleasing topic for you to discuss, but I have one more question. And here we have Osa being very creepy, asking, Have you acted upon this lust in any way? I'm not going to narrate this bit because I want this video to be monetized. Osa then says, Hopefully, it was a good one at least. That's something everybody wants to hear from a priest. To absolve your sins, do a ritual sacrifice or two, and you should be good. Nothing like a good old-fashioned crucifixion. And try to get good sleep eat your vitamins, and love your neighbor. We might as well add flossing and regular exercise to that list. Exiting the confession booth, Marina feels a weight has been lifted from her shoulders, as if all of her sins have been absolved. With your confession, you feel your affinity with Ulmer growing, which is actually very useful for unlocking skills, including the blood portals. Osa bursts out of the confession booth and says, It was a joke, it was a joke. He states the obvious that says, My apologies, I am not a priest of Ulmer. This was just too good of an opportunity to pass. I could get to know the true you. Marina says that she feels exploited. Osa replies, I didn't mean to belittle your troubles by any means. With the festival going on, you cannot truly trust anyone, so I figure it wouldn't be too big of an offense to play a little trick. Well then, I got the information I needed. I think I must continue on my journey. Time is not exactly a resource we have in excess. Marina does the only logical thing, which is to kill Osa for what he's done and absorb his soul and consume his power. Abella says that we shouldn't be fighting and stays out of it at first. Osa starts chanting just like the yellow mages do. Marina attacks the arm, hoping to stop him from casting spells, but the black goat does a one-hit kill to the head, ending the fight before it had even started. Marina absorbs the enlightened soul, which will allow her to unlock the spice forge skill, which will be extremely powerful coupled with her spells. We loot Osa's body and get a soul stone and the beheaded wizard, which is Nasra's head. 
from part one after being burnt to a crisp by Grogoroth, and now he looks like a raisin. We also take Osa's head to trade with Pocket Cat with. Talking to Pocket Cat allows you to trade participant heads for skin Bibles. I have Abella equip the Yellow Mage robes since you only lose one unit of defense but gain a lot in magic defense, so why not? Having done that, we return to the bookstore so that we can sleep and start unlocking some skills. Once we have the Spice Forge and can insta-cast a spell at the very beginning of every fight, the game's difficulty drops a lot and makes exploring a lot easier. Marina falls asleep here and is surprised to hear heavy breathing through her sleep. She wakes up and finds the black-haired girl Samory spying on her, which works out pretty well. I was going to locate her later to get her soul so we can unlock two of her skills, which, along with visiting the orphanage, makes it very easy to get affinity with Sylvian and Grogoroth. So Marina continues her murderous rampage and attacks her. Samory slowly creeps around you. Why would you do this, she asks. I guess, uh, power, to get more power and consume her soul. Also, fighting her in her human form is a lot easier than fighting her moon-scorched form, Dysmorphia. Samory casts Hurting on Marina, but luckily, since I had just equipped the wizard head, the spell is reflected back to Samory. One more time, she pleads with Marina to stop. Marina focuses her attacks on her arms to prevent Samory from casting any more spells. And I just repeat that pattern for the next turn. At this point, my three ref points are filled up, so I use them. Now she's disarmed, and with the goat slash hit, the fight's done. And from her, we absorb the radiating soul, which is very useful if you're trying to get affinity for Grogoroth, which unlocks offensive spells, and Sylvian, which unlocks healing spells. With the corpse next to the bed, Marina, after a long day, lays down to get some much needed sleep. Morning of the first day is done. 11 participants remain, with three falling to Marina's hand today. The feathered jester says, seems you are very much acquainted with your fellow contestants already. Very delightful to see such progress already. Keep up the pace. The festival won't last forever. Since the 11 of you are such late additions to the party, your days are already running short. The festival will see its climax in three days. This is how long you have. The jester suggests that you gut, scheme, and revel in the bloody remains of your rival contestants. It is a simple festival at its core. What you do and what you don't do is entirely up to you. Do you want to kill your fellow contestants? After that conversation, we're able to access the hexen table to unlock skills. So we unlock the dance, which increases magic damage as the fight goes on, meditation, which increases how much rev you have in each fight, and spice forge, which allows you to place modifiers on some spells. From Grogoros affinity, we unlock hurting and smog, which will be our workhorse offensive spells. And with that, we start the second segment of the first day. We open the menu to use the spice forge skill I use it to assign the blue spice to hurting, making it cheaper, and the white spice to black smog so that it auto cast at the beginning of every combat encounter. So how about we go test this new combination of skills and see how much more combat effective it makes us. Since we fought a few of them, we encounter a bobby and fight him with our new skills and let's see how it goes. So the fight starts and Marina auto-cast first Black Smog, which damages and destroys all of the Bobby's limbs, stopping him from being able to attack us, though he can still use Tackle with his torso. So obviously I'll concentrate damage on his torso, trying to end the fight. On the next turn, he does regrow all of his arms. So I continue to concentrate damage on his torso, trying to put him down. He does manage to get several hits on the goat, but fortunately he's able to tank him. So in the next turn, I use up all my rev and we're able to end the fight.
So I have to say, after the first test, having the Spice Forge on the smog is extremely useful. It effectively gave us one free turn in advantage at the very beginning of the fight. Taking a left at the fork in the road, we encounter the ever so notorious Pocket Cat. We find him crouch over a burlap sack, which he proceeds to beat repeatedly with a blackjack. Dressed in white pants, a purple vest, and what appears to be a purple plastic mask, Pocket Cat stands up. The servant of the Moon God Rare says, Here I am busy with my own business, completely ignoring this beautiful chapette. All apologies, pleased to meet you. You can call me Pocket Cat. You have one of those familiar faces. I feel like we've met somewhere before, perhaps in a past life. Things sure have changed since then, haven't they? We live in peculiar times. The world has gone through true darkness. The world has been at a standstill, in a deep rest. People stocked up on toilet paper and hid in their homes with their loved ones. They were waiting for that glimpse of light just because they knew that even darkness has a breaking point. Say, oh sport, what do you think follows such intense darkness? Marina replies, chaos and confusion. To which the man-cat replies, yes, not light or darkness, but gray. Very insightful indeed. From personal experience, I'd say a true darkness is followed by chaos. The mind, or the common consciousness we all share, strives for something new. When one is truly done with the darkness, one strives for new, with such vigor that growing pains are inevitable. But therein lies the danger. You see, chaos can ragdoll us into any one direction. The direction is not always towards the light. Sometimes one can find themselves lost in the limbo that is chaos. When you enter the limbo from a dark place, there is a big chance that you contaminate the chaos with your darkness and just create a new pitch black place, maybe even darker than the one before. The Catman proceeds by saying, I guess I'm just rambling here, letting my mind wander and mouth slander as they say. You know me, when I get excited, I can go on and on and on. I don't mean to take your time. From what I understand, you've got your hands full with the festival. So I'll get straight to the point. Not only a wandering gentleman, but I am also a head salesman of sorts with deep, deep pockets. But what is a head salesman, you ask? Well, it is exactly what it sounds. I'm willing to part from my valuable collection if the price is right and the price is severed heads of those participating in the festival. A cob, I know, but you get used to it. God knows I did. And with that, the pussy man takes his leave. We'll be seeing him again later. Entering the alleyways to the west, only a lone wind howl accompanies you in these empty alleyways. Marina passes a wall covered with pictures and letters for all the people that have gone missing recently in Preheville. Continuing down the alleyway, we encounter two fecal dogs, which are absolutely disgusting creatures. Fortunately, the first black smog takes one of them out. And since he's already hurt, the other one is not too much more work. Marina collects the head trophies and moves on, finding a yummy mushroom stew in the trash. Moving through this area is a little bit tense because it's one of the areas where the mob might be able to spawn. The mob is a special enemy type that can only be found once per playthrough. It is composed of three different infected villagers, one with a meat grinder, one with a rifle, and one that attacks with melee. Since they attack together, they present a major threat to the enemy, but if you are able to take them out, you do get the bench grinder item, which is a crafting component for one of the best items in the game, the meat grinder, which can be crafted with a Bella's weapon craft skill. Here, we are exploring an emptied apartment building, 
Honestly, there's not too much loot or lore in this building. Along with the hotel, it feels like one of the areas that might be fleshed out in later content updates. Combat initializes when an old hag sneaks up on us, but the black smog does enough damage to her head that we take her down on the very first turn. We continue down the alleyway, making our way to the shopping street of Preheville when we encounter more fecal dogs. So Marina equips a handgun to deal with them from afar. The firearm feels oddly heavy in her hands. She didn't think it would feel like this. Marina realizes that she's carrying a tool meant for killing and that just adds to the burden. It's a surreal feeling. Nervously, you take a firmer grasp on the pistol grip and aim down its iron sights. Pew pew! The fecal dogs, along with the cherubs, are a very numerous, annoying enemy type. But fortunately, they will go down with just one hit from the Luger. Bang bang. Though she's a powerful occultist magic user, Marina is not opposed to using firearms if she needs to. From here, we can head north and enter the shopping street. Now that I have a few basic spells and the Spice Forge, my next goal is to go to Dr. Kiefer's magic shop and buy the Small Things Amulet. The purpose of the Small Things Amulet is to increase my agility. If your agility is over 16, you get two actions per combat turn. And having high agility and two actions per turn will be essential when we fight the Heartless One. There are other ways to increase agility that we will also be using. One of them is a skill from Tanaka that gives you plus one agility. And the other one is using the engrave skill on yourself when you have the skin bible of the God of Fear and Hunger. And for a temporary boost, you can also use the pep pills. Once on the promenade, we enter the Ranka Cafe. There's only really one purpose to come in here, and that's because there's a lot of alcohol. Alcohol refills mind, which one, keeps you sane and alive, and two, functions like magic points. So having a lot of alcohol on hand will make sure you can always cast spells. Returning to the promenade, we're going to see a big poster that is a reference to the Heartless One, and also to the Fear Hunger community member that inspired the Heartless One, Ketsuke. In this area, we also find some creatures that are a creation of stitches, the Soul Job. The Soul Jobs appear as animated umbrellas made of human limbs sewn together, and the base of which is three heads attached. Entering the department store, we hear screaming and bellowing coming from the top floor. We enter the clothing section and find a chainmail dress, which will be a nice upgrade to our leather armor, which Marina equips, and then Abella now gets the leather armor. With the new better armor in hand, we head back outside and make our way to Dr. Kiefer's magic shop, which is the first merchant we'll be seeing in this playthrough. And the first chance to spend the chillings that we've been picking up so far. A smell of old spices and incense fills the dusty air. The shopkeeper asks Marina what her name is and then proceeds to curse her out. Now that introductions are out of the way, Dr. Kiefer is ready to trade. We buy a Battel stone, which will regenerate the magic points of anybody that has it equipped, making it very useful for magic users. And the small things amulet that we talked about just a little bit ago. So now I can insta cast a spell, regenerate MP, have better armor, and soon I'll be able to have two actions per turn. In the back of the store, Dr. Kiefer's tricks and magic, there is a magic lamp resting on the desk. Walking up to it and interacting with it, you have the option of rubbing it. Afterwards, a disturbance in the radio next to you will be noticeable. Hanging around too long, we see a Poe or a ghost materialize out of the radio and start chasing you after he sees you. Fighting him, he only has one attack, and that's to try to catch you in the grasp of a genie, a coin flip attack. If he's successful, well, he'll do this.
With the items in hand, let's head back to the shopping street and make our way to the Prehevo Bop. The Prehevo Bop functions like a staging area or a safe point in the middle of the city. There, you can rest and save, you can open a blood portal, and if you have Dan in your party, you can always refill your mind meter for free. Also, the jazz music here is very relaxing. So essentially, it's like a home away from home or your little refuge in the center of Prehevo. Entering the Prehevo Bop, we see a blue moth that is an indication that there's a hidden basement floor beneath this one that Rayla is trying to tell us about. But before exploring that, I go around the bar and light all the candles to get some nice mood lighting going on. Investigating the floor underneath where we saw the blue moth reveals a secret ladder to a hidden basement. This hidden basement is a staging point for the NLU Rebels, the nameless Liberty Underground. Here, they had bunk beds for agents to sleep in and hide from the authorities, weapons, but also a map showing four important locations across the city that Marina copies to her map. These four locations are the locations of the Teletroscope Station and the location of the Logic, the Machine God. Searching the bookshelf, Marina finds a book titled The Last Frontier Chapter 1. Reading it gives us a little bit of history of the foreign land of Vinland. The legends report that in the year 1009, a group of explorers from Odengard first made contact with the island region of Vinland. This is the first written record of the continent. The next confirmed case dates back to the year 1310 when a small fleet from Abyssonia ventured to the dark waters of the west. However, it would take another 200 years before an established trade route would be formed again by the seafarers of Odengard in the year 1577. It was during this escapade that the continent was named Vinland translating to Wineland, supposedly because of the amount of wine required to wipe the memories clean of the land and the horrors it contained. Despite the existence of the continent becoming more common knowledge among the scholars of the Western world, ventures to the said land were very rare. In the year 1650, a scholar from the Vatican City wrote the following description of the land. The soil consists of minerals that seem to reject sunlight and warmth altogether, resulting the ground to look like a continuous, colorless black mass where it's hard to measure depth of each hill and basin with a naked eye. And the few plants that manage to grow in this hostile ground end up taking these very same features. Thus, the landscape merges together as far as the eye can see. Just endless darkness. If you are lucky, the clouds might shift a little and you can at the least tell where the land ends and where the gloomy sky begins. The land is cursed. The land is morbid and dark. Each settler comes back with vivid stories of a very personal nightmare they went through during their stay in Vinland. The discovery of this continent is the biggest mistake that mankind has ever made. You'll always find a rifle, a shotgun, and a pistol in this basement. Along with this ritual circle where you can open a blood portal. Which I can't do yet since I don't have the Ulmer skin bible. And with that, it's a good a time as any to advance time a little bit and also to unlock some more skills. So I choose one of the bunk beds to get some sleep in. And this is going to advance time to the night of the first day. We are still at 11 participants out of the 14, but now I'll be able to use some soul stones to unlock some more skills. The first one is from Tanaka's tree. I get agility plus one, which along with the bonus to agility from the small things amulet will now give Marina 16 agility, which is enough to get double actions per turn. I also finish unlocking Marina's tree, which gives me greater occultism which means I'll be starting each battle with two ref points. Along with double turns, because of 16 agility, means that Marina will be getting a lot more attacks than previously. Marina approaches and speaks to Abella. Abella says, This is an old speakeasy of the club 
that has been converted into a hideout. She tells us that some kind of revolutionaries used to hide there. They were clearly against both the Bremen militia and the Easter Union that used to occupy this area. And after that, we recruit her back into the party, along with the goat. Now that I have 16 agility and the spice forge, I'm going to continue filling up my party by recruiting Corinne, who can be found by the newspaper office in West Bremen. Searching the trash cans in this area for loot and supplies, I find some more dirty toilet paper. I'll add it to the collection as a sign of good luck. Making my way back to the stairs, we encounter August, the Mega Chad. Like Abella, he's also from Odengard, and he's a descendant from Rag, from the first game. He keeps it a secret, but he's in Preheville on a mission hunting Lagarde. West Preheville shows a lot more war damage than the other parts of the city that we've already explored. There's sandbag barricades, landmines, and very obvious artillery damage everywhere. We can make a guess that, that this is where the resistance made its stand against the Bremen army. Marina explores the bombed out buildings for more loot. And as every house does in Preheville, she grabs the white vial out of the refrigerator. They're so ubiquitous and I have no idea why. But anyway, we've arrived at the newspaper office and find Corinne taking pictures of the battlefield. After seeing more of the horrors of the city, she agrees that it's safer in numbers and is better to team up. With her in our party, we enter the news agency to explore and loot. Uh, I just woke up from a nap. Viewer, I hope you're able to have a nice nap today. Naps are lovely, but back to fear and hunger. So we are exploring the news agency. There is one unique encounter and item that we'll have here where we see the image of Rayla. Rayla is a brilliant young engineer that's also Olivia's sister. The last Olivia's known of her is that Rayla's been kidnapped by the Bremen Empire and Olivia has come to Preheville to figure out why, what interest does the Kaiser have in her sister. Also, since I just recruited Corinne, I need to equip her with the best gear that I have. So I upgrade her weapon with an axe, I give her Tanaka's hat, and for the accessories, I give her the eyeglasses, which increases accuracy, and the eye of Sylvian, which increases the potency of healing items. Going down to the next level, we encounter a cocoon villager. Part of his body, arm, and face have been hardened by this cocoon that's taking over him. And we get another chance to see how effective the Spice Forge is. So combat starts and ends right away as the Black Smog deals enough damage to the enemy's head to end the combat. So we continue underground, where Abella has a chance to shine and use her short circuit skill to get us past this locked door, which leads us to a tunnel underground that leads to the building next door. Taking the ladder back up to the surface level, we reappear on the war-torn streets of West Preheville. Some executed bodies are visible being hung from the nearby buildings. We run into another cocoon villager here, but our magic spells help make the fight a lot easier. And since I have greater occultism, Marina starts with three ref points, meaning that on her first turn she gets two attacks. And the fight is ended quickly, as the goat again goes for the head. Making our way carefully in between the landmines, we enter this door, which leads us into this very quiet building that has taken heavy damage. Following a long hallway, we arrive at a little garden that has survived the recent chaos intact. Here, we see the specter of Rayla as she's surrounded by blue moths. She turns to look at us and then disappears again. Inspecting the rose bush, we get the one winged necklace. If you play as Olivia, you can combine it with a starting item that she has to make an upgraded version. But for this run through, it will still be useful for its magic defense. We encounter another cocoon villager. He goes down quickly as soon as we cast Black Smog. From here, we continue south through the ruined streets of Preheville, a city fallen from grace. 
we are attacked by a zombified soldier with a pistol. The black smog does destroy his arms, but he still performs the coin flip attack on us, taking a point blank shot. But fortunately, luck is on our side this time, and Marina dodges the shot. Since the soldier zombie doesn't have much health, he goes down quickly with a hit to the torso. Immediately afterwards, we go after the villager with a rifle. The smog destroys his legs, but his arms and head survive. But one hit to the head changes that. So let's continue south. My goal here is to unlock the shortcut to the deep woods from the area where we started the game by dropping the ladder. Through the mist and the fog, we see a doppelganger of Olivia running laps in the forest. We have nothing to gain by interacting with her, so I just move on. The deep woods here are filled with owl cultists that hide in the leaves waiting for someone to come by. In the deeper woods, we loot this tent for ammo. And continue heading south, where I'm ambushed by an owl cultist. The black smog does some damage, but not enough to take him down. Since Marina starts with three rev points, I use them up to get two attacks in on the first turn. Fortunately, we are able to dish out enough damage to take him down the first turn before he can summon help. We head south a little bit more and we make it back to the outskirts of Preheville where the game started. Here I can lower this ladder to allow transit back and forth to deep woods and the area with the train where the game started. With that done, I start heading back into the city where I hear a glass breaking which symbolizes an ambush by the mob. I didn't want to fight them so early on in the game, but I figure why not give it a try. The mob has a lot of HP and can deal a lot of damage, making them one of the toughest fights in the game. Generally, you'll want to go for the meat grinder first since he can dismember you and inflict the bleed status effect. I'm going to use Abella's wrench toss ability to keep the meat grinder stunned so he can't attack, while I use everybody else to try to apply as much damage as I can but inevitably, the mob will still be able to get attacks in. I just hope they keep missing. I use up my three ref points with Marina on my extra turn to try to do as much damage as I can. The next turn starts, I have Marina again attack the meat grinder, Abella re-equip her wrench so I can toss it again, and I have Corinne also attack the meat grinder. Marina attacks and Corinne lands a critical attack for a total damage of about a thousand points, but it's still not enough to take the meat grinder down. On her extra turn, I have Marina cast Black Smog to hurt everybody, and fortunately, that's enough damage to take down the meat grinder. So one down, two to go. Abella and Corinne both use up their three ref points so that they both get double attacks. And that's enough to take the Rifleman down. Two down, one to go. So now I'm just gonna have everybody focus all their attacks on the remaining Cocoon Man. And with one more hit, the fight is over. Now, I can collect the Bench Grinder, which is one of the rarest crafting items in the game. At most, you can only get three per run. And now, I head back into the city to the Preheville Bop. On the way, I accidentally initiate combat with the Soul Jobs, but fortunately, with the better equipment and spells that I have, the fights get trivialized and I'm able to make it through fairly easy. Usually, the first black smog that's casted at the beginning of every fight generally ends the fight by applying enough damage to the heads. So from now on, at least, I won't have to worry about these guys every time I run through here. So now I go back to the Preheville Bop where I'm going to sleep a couple times and advance time to the morning of day two so I can recruit Dan in the white mode apartments. After resting, advancing time, and saving the game, I head back out. Since I'm doing pretty good with combat, 
I decide to pick a fight with the Inquisitor to see how fast I can take him down. Inquisitors can use the bell that they're carrying to summon help, calling a Bobby into the fight. I use Marina to cast Black Smog since it hits every limb on every monster. I get lucky and that's enough to take out the Bobby. So now I'm going to have everybody focus their damage on the Inquisitor to try to prevent him from casting hurting on me. Fortunately, Abella lands a critical attack on his arm. Now, I just need to keep applying damage to the torso and the fight will soon be over. Searching the Inquisitor's body, I find another soul stone, which is always welcomed. I continue south to the white mode apartments. Entering the building, the door locks behind me. We're not gonna get out of here until we're able to solve the riddle and we've collected the effigy. Our goal here is to recruit Dan and take him back to the Prehevo Bob so he can always fill up our mind meter and also to get the first of the three effigies that we're going to need to unlock the secret passage at the Church of Almer. We collect the master key and we head upstairs to recruit Dan and to get the diary of a madman, which we'll need to solve the washing machine puzzle. The white mold apartments are quiet and dusty. Everything has been overrun by a white mold that keeps doors locked and everything in place, glued to whatever surface they're touching. The halls here are patrolled by the neighbor monsters, which we can assume are corrupted people that used to live in these apartments. We fight one of the neighbor creatures and the black smog destroys the head on the first turn. Entering this apartment, we see some cracks in the floor to the right and a heavy horse statue to the left. So we push the horse statue onto the cracks in order to get access to the room directly beneath us, where we'll find Dan and the Diary of a Madman. We jump into the newly formed hole and fall to the apartment a level beneath us. Here we find Dan studying a sigil on the floor. Dan, like Levi, is a little bit of a tragic figure. He was recruited into the army due to the Great War and did active service on the front, seeing combat. Upon completion of his service, he returned home just to find the tragic sight, seeing the woman that he loves dead and father-in-law, who had taken him in when he was a young boy, both perished trying to carry out a ritual to one of the old gods. Dan desperately tried to resurrect his wife, Elise, even sacrificing his eye in a dark spell. But tragically, that wasn't enough. Dan swore to learn more about the old gods and the occult. And it's his research that led him to Preheville, seeking answers for what happened to Elise. Why did she have to die? Speaking with Dan, he asked, That sigil on the floor, do you know what it means? I've been following a trace, a trace that led me to this house, to this sigil. It's a sigil I've only seen once in my life, but I have no idea what it represents. I browsed through the raving documents of the man who used to reside here. Most of it was illegible, but from what I did understand, he was preparing for a ritual for an older god, deity, or whatever. Like the sigil, This ritual too is something I've seen once before, but I have no idea what it all means. I wonder if the ritual was complete or not. Marina suggests that maybe the sigil is the source of the chaos in the city, to which Dan replies that there is always a scientific answer to everything. Whether that science exceeds the science of today is another topic entirely, but it's always something you can study and learn. Well, no use moping around. Dan says that he could use the company and ask if he can join you. He then finally introduces himself. Marina picks up the book at the center of the sigil and collects the diary of a madman. With that, we can head to the basement to solve the washing machine puzzle and get access to the otherworldly version of the apartments where we will find one of the three effigies. So I head back down and go to the basement. There are two ways to solve the washing machine puzzle. First is you can brute force it. If you can apply enough damage in one turn, you don't have to solve the puzzle. But I'm not quite there yet with this party.
The puzzle itself is pretty straightforward. You read the diary of the madman, and he has a list of the order in which he will sacrifice his neighbors in the apartment. So the code is the apartment numbers in that order. So I enter the apartment numbers and the washing machine stops. And now I can enter it and make my way to the other world to get the effigy. Coming out at the other end of the tunnel through the washing machine, we notice a greasy stench fills the humid air. Going to the level above, we can see that in this version of the apartments, the residences have been turned into prison cells. Like in the real version of the apartments, the other world apartments are also patrolled by the neighbor creatures. Fighting one, I again see how useful the first black smog spell can be. And not far from here, we can see another one of the golden gates that connect all the other world regions. Inside the cells, we see bodies attached to chairs with tubes coming out of where the head and the neck would be, pumping a fluid out. Some people believe that this is how the neighbor creatures are formed. Another interesting feature about the neighbor creatures is that the shirts that they wear seem to fit them so well. I'm a little bit jealous. I can't find shirts that fit me that well, especially not around the neck. The design of the neighbor creature with the heavy meaty bludgeons for hands resembles an enemy type in Silent Hill 3. The game creator, Miro, snuck in a lot of homages to the Silent Hill series in the game. The story of a serial killer hunting down his neighbors in an apartment complex in order to carry out an ancient ritual to an old god is reminiscent of the story in Silent Hill 4 The Room. The second phase of the Shambara boss fight in part 1 with the pool of blood and the concentric rings is also a callback to Silent Hill 4. The crow mauler could be said to have been designed in the style of Pyramid Head. I mean that in the role that he plays out in the game as this dogged pursuer. And we can also add the persistent fog to that list. But all of that's not to say that fear and hunger doesn't do its own thing. I just like all these callbacks to survival horror tradition and history that Miro snuck into the game. Marina continues her ascent in the otherworldly apartments. Reaching the level above, she notices all the hot air from the lower floors must have risen up here. A lesser known reference to Silent Hill is the naming of Valtel. Valtel is a new god in part one, the enlightened one. His name is a reference to the old gods that we learn about in the lore of Silent Hill 2. The new gods are humans who have made the journey to Mahabra and managed to ascend to godhood, trying to get some of the power from the old gods, not knowing that they're just continuing to play into the old god's hands like puppets. We find our first effigy being held by a winged statue. It's the fellatio effigy. Not knowing why, Marina feels that this statuette is of great importance. Effigy in hand, we are now clear to leave the white mode apartments and start our hunt for the second effigy. Returning to the real world, the front door to the apartment building is unlocked. We are now free to leave the building again. Marina and her squad travel the short distance back to the Preheville Bop, where Dan will now serve as a bartender and hand out drinks that will refill everybody's mind meter. Marina requests a drink of whiskey, which Dan promptly serves up. A glass of old Vinland whiskey, even before sipping from the finely decorated glass, the rich and deep aroma fills your nostrils. You wait for a brief second before taking the first sip. The whiskey gives a small burning sensation on its way down, but still, you savor the taste for as long as it lingers on the tip of your tongue. A deep warmth fills your insides long after the glass is empty. You finish the drink. If you get Henrik to the food storage in the mayor's basement and Dan to the Preheville Bob, you'll be able to always fill up your hunger meter and your mind meter whenever you want, unlimited times. Next, let's go recruit Olivia. But first, we need to have the encounter with Marco and Pav, 
so that Marco can get the wheelchair to Olivia. Tanaka would be there if he were alive. Backtracking through Preheville, we see bodies of poor innocent civilians in the streets, and trash littered everywhere. A bit further south, in front of the restaurant, we encounter Pav holding Marco at gunpoint. Marco says, take it easy, it was just a big misunderstanding. We can continue our separate ways and everyone stays alive for tomorrow. To which Pav replies, it's easy to feel remorse when you're looking down the barrel of a gun. Marina intercedes before the Bremen lieutenant can shoot Marco. Starting the encounter, Pav whips out a pistol faster than anyone's able to react to and takes a shot and hits Corinne. Marina casts Black Smog, which hurts Pav but doesn't stop him. For the first turn, I focus damage on his arm to stop him from being able to shoot at us, and Corinne is able to take revenge on Pav for shooting her by hitting him in the torso and finally stopping him. Marina absorbs the chaotic soul. Marco thanks Marina and says much appreciated as he picks up the folding wheelchair. Marco adds, I'm not proud of it, but I see a Bremen officer. I punch before asking questions. I'm sure he would have shot me if you didn't stop him. That's enough proof of his intentions. He was a bad man, but it's not like I wanted him cold in the gutter. I'm heading back to the train. It seems to be the safest area I've seen so far. I recommend you follow me. And with that, Marco heads off to the south, back to the train, with the wheelchair that Olivia needs. Little did Marco know about Pav's true intentions here in Preheville. You see, though he was a Bremen officer, he was not loyal to the Bremen Empire or the Kaiser. When Pav was a child, the Kaiser and the Bremen army was responsible for destroying Pav's village and killing a lot of the people that he cared about. So Pav joined the Bremen army and worked his way up the ranks in hopes of getting a chance to assassinate the Kaiser. And that's why he's here in Preheville on a secret personal assassination mission in revenge for his people. Returning to the train, we find the boxer, Marco, and the botanist, Olivia. We talk to Olivia and ask her to join our party. She's more than happy to move around and see for herself what is going on around here. Though it may not be apparent, Olivia can be an extremely powerful character and she has some extremely powerful skills, specifically the skill toxicology that allows you to make condensed hemlock, but we'll be talking a lot about that later on in the video. With Olivia in our party, let's return to the city, taking the other path that we didn't take the first time that we walked into the city. Approaching the river, we see fragments of destroyed old statues lined up next to the river. We cross a makeshift bridge before approaching a rifle villager. But with the Spice Forge and a full party, he has no chance against us. From here, we head north and break into the sewers. With a full party, we should be able to apply enough damage to break the door down. And it also helps that Marina can attack twice. Dealing about a thousand points of damage is generally enough to break down metallic doors. Traveling north in the sewers, approaching the city, we have to contend with a few neighbor creatures, but it's nothing that we can't deal with. Before long, we arrive at the water treatment station. This area of the sewers basically divides the sewers into two different parts, which will not be connected until you solve this puzzle and you're able to make your way through the area by lowering a ladder and toggling the right switches. We'll be back to this area once we need to go down to the Foundations of Decay. And just a little further down past the sewage treatment puzzle, we find a sewer hole that puts us back near the Prehevo Bop. We stop by the speakeasy and grab another drink from Dan. This time, instead of a glass of whiskey, we go for an old fashioned. You rock the ice around the glass a few times. The old fashioned settles down and you cache its scent that is a mix of both sweet and musky. 
you taste the drink briefly to check out the exact ratio of its ingredients. The whiskey, which seems to be on the more expensive side, is clearly the dominating flavor, but the sugar and the water help the drink row off your tongue more easily. You are pleased to notice that the herbal taste of the Angostura only hints with its presence afterwards, never trying to rival the key ingredients. It soon becomes evident that this drink is a perfectly mixed old fashioned. It has all the best qualities of a good whiskey, but it's casual enough for you to drink it like a sailor. Finishing the drink, we head back out. Now that we've had a stiff drink, we head back to the sewers and start making our way to the foundations of decay in order to collect the second effigy. On the way there, we encounter Levi's doppelganger. We don't know exactly why the doppelgangers are appearing, and we also don't know why there are only doppelgangers of certain characters. For example, Marco and Abella don't have doppelgangers. So we make our way back to the sewage treatment area, and then we push this box into the path of the water, and then turn the water back on. This will push the box out of the way, leaving just one for us that we can push. And this puts us on the path to the foundations of the K, a series of tunnels underneath the city, which are illuminated by the blue-green hue of mushrooms. The air down here is heavy, moist, and musky. The path through the foundations of the K will lead us to the basement of the Church of Ulmer. And since we didn't crash the chandelier into the basement, we'll still have access to the rusty key, which we'll need to summon the heartless one. We find a statue surrounded by a pile of bodies down here, along with mushrooms, herbs, and the ratkin, which are humanoid looking rats. Our next objective is to make it to the basement in the Church of Almer, where we'll be able to get the second effigy. Exploring the tunnels down here allow us to get a lot of mushrooms which are edible. We'll be able to make our own mushroom stew, so no more needing to drink soup that we found in the trash, like we did earlier. And we also pick up some spare blue herbs, which are always useful for healing. We follow the ratkin all the way down to the end of the tunnel, and start seeing human skulls everywhere. Walking into their den, they spring a trap on us. A single ratkin isn't much of a threat, but in a group they definitely are. Fortunately, we have ways of dealing with groups. The Black Smog spell will be particularly useful here since it can hit all enemies. This is also a good opportunity to use some of the gasoline canisters I've been carrying around. So I have a better use one. An exploding canister will hit all enemies on the field. Fortunately, the Ratkin will sometimes get distracted in battle and just scratch themselves. So it's unlikely that they will all attack every turn. I keep having Marina cast Black Smog to keep applying damage to everybody while Abella is going to attack the gasoline canister to make it explode. And with that, the first Ratkin goes down. And luck is on our side, it seems like the Ratkin are prone to missing their attacks. But one hit got through to Marina, and now she has the infected status that we can heal after the fight using a green herb. Two down, four to go. Some of the ratkin got the on fire status from the gasoline canister and they are taking damage every turn. On the next turn, I'll be able to use up everybody's rev points so everybody will be able to attack twice for a total of eight attacks. And the ratkin just keep missing attacks, not complaining. Fortunately, everybody being able to attack twice was exactly what I needed to finish the fight. I loot the first chest and get an officer sword, which I don't really need. And on the second chest, you can always get an Eye of Sylvian, which is nice to have, but not vital. Before I go, I collect all the heads since I still have a lot of skills I'm gonna want to unlock. So we continue further down these tunnels. 
Entering a wide open cavern, we see something approach us, something from the far past of fear and hunger. It's Moonless from the Dungeon of Fear and Hunger, although she's grown a lot in the hundreds of years that have passed since. In the first Fear and Hunger game, Moonless was kind of like the analog to the goat, an early game animal companion that you can pick up. She's such a good puppy. It takes her a few turns to approach you from the shadows, so you have a little bit of time to cast some spells to weaken her or to cast some buffs to help you out in the coming fight. I have a Bella put out a gasoline canister that I'm going to detonate once Moonless is closer. I can't do any type of physical attacks that I know of, so most of the party is just going to wait and guard while Marina cast Greater Hurting. Moonless in Fear and Hunger Part 1 is relatively easy to recruit. The only requirement to recruit Moonless is to have two pieces of rotten meat. When you encounter her in the caverns, you use your talk skill and just feed her twice and then she'll join the party, which is a little bit easier than with the goat, where you have to get the basement key from the woodsman and also have the skin bible of rare to be able to travel to the other world and talk to the man in black. Fear and Hunger 1 actually has more non-playable characters that are recruitable that aren't one of the main characters that can join the party, such as the skeletons, the ghouls, Moonless, and Nasra. In Fear and Hunger 2, there's only ghouls and the goat that aren't of the main characters that you can recruit into your party. After a few turns, Moonless is close enough for us to get a good look at her and she's also finally in melee range. She has two swords embedded in her hide, the Miasma and the Black Steel. If you knock off the Black Steel, you get to keep it and it's a pretty good melee weapon. You can't keep the Miasma, but attacking it will stop it from attacking you. I use up everybody's rev points and also detonate the gasoline canister to try to do some damage to Moonless. Fortunately, she is weak to fire. As expected, having Marina be able to take two actions per turn is always useful, especially once we get the sword, the Red Virtue, a little bit later in this playthrough. We spend the next few turns trading blows with Moonless and patching up our party members when necessary, but before long, August interrupts the fight. He jumps in between Marina and Moonless and says, hold it, I'll take care of her. August soothes Moonless and tells her that we are not the enemy. August explains that Moonless is an old family acquaintance, only reinforcing the theory that he is a descendant of Ragnavadar. He gives you some healing items to make up for any damage that you took from Moonless. And with that, August takes his leave and bounces away like a ninja into the darkness. We also see some blue moths here that tells us that we are on the path to activating another one of the teletroscope stations connected to the logic. There is no power to use the elevator, but there are ropes hanging in the shaft that could be used to climb down. Interesting little fact, if you kill August before the encounter with Moonless, there's no one to stop you from fighting her. So the fight ends with you killing Moonless after all these years. Searching the underground bunker, we find the NLU Reconnaissance Report. NLU Reconnaissance Report number one, quick bullet points of the reconnaissance. Nameless Liberty Underground, the organization's roots date back to the First Great War. Formed from a small groups participating in civil disobedience across different regions in Europa, Voronilla, and the Eastern Sanctuaries, became more organized with partisan fighters and professionals with experience in guerrilla warfare. The organization formed under NLU name after the First Great War, loosely connected throughout Europa. No centralized leader figure Spies in high-ranking positions in the armies of, of the Eastern Union, Bremen Empire, and Allied forces. Recently has taken action in sabotaging both Allied forces, Operation Bow and Arrow, 
as well as Eastern Union Operation Logic. Bohemian Sect considered a threat to Operation Logic. We follow the blue moths and promptly find another teletroscope station. We also find Tanaka's doppelganger down here. His head rotates 180 degrees in place and complains about the train schedule. Speaking to him, he says good afternoon and introduces himself as Kira Tanaka. When we attack him, he says that he's going to swallow us whole. The doppelgangers aren't more powerful than the regular participants, so the first black smog is enough to take them down. Killing doppelgangers will allow you to get a participant head, which you can use to trade with Pocket Cat, but it won't grant you the soul that allows you to unlock skills. Marina climbs the elevator shaft cables to go back up to where she was and then climbs the cables again on the other side to continue ascending. Exiting the bunker takes us to a tunnel that will lead us to some old catacombs. It's dark inside, looks like a crypt. You're not sure because of the darkness, but it almost looks like there are figures standing there. Marina enters the crypt to investigate. She finds that the walls are adorned with skulls and skeleton monks are propped up standing here. One of them collapses as soon as Marina approaches. A bit further down in this tunnel in the foundations of the K, we find the elevator that leads up to the slums and the church of Almer. This elevator was used by the dark priest of the church to prey on the people in the slums for their dark rituals. Entering the church of Almer through the foundations of decay allows us to get the rusty key. The rusty key is an item necessary in unlocking the fight with the heartless one. The Heartless One is a new god and she functions as an optional super boss that gives you very good loot. We'll be fighting her and I'll be getting the Red Virtue Sword, which stands in contrast to the Blue Sin Sword in Part 1. Entering the church basement, Marina notices that the basement is filled with a scent of gore. Between the bodies and the blood, there is evidence everywhere of the extreme levels of ritual violence that occur down here at the direction of the Dark Priest. We pick up the rusty key, which we will soon use to get the heart-shaped lock. In the far back of the basement, opposite of the entrance, we find the second effigy, the Martyr Effigy. So two down and one more to go that we're going to pick up from the orphanage. This is also when the first Crimson Fodder sneaks up on us. Exploring the basement, Marina finds these giant pools of blood. This is where the Crimson Fodders are able to regenerate their bodies from. The Crimson Fodders are otherworldly creatures drawn by bloodshed. At first, they appear like snails, but if they make their way to a large enough pool of blood, they're able to reconstitute a body for themselves that they'll use to continue the bloodshed. They must have been summoned to the Church of Almer's basement because of all the bloodshed of the rituals that the Dark Priest carried out. The Crimson Fodders are attracted to bloodshed the same way that snails come out after the rain. If you beat one in a fight, you'll have to make sure to stomp on the snail before it makes its way back to a pool of blood. Entering this cell, we see a chained up pillar man, but he leaves us alone for some reason. Going deeper into the basement of the church, we find multiple ritual circles that the dark priests were using in secret for their prayers to the old gods. We have 39 non-contestant heads. We can turn these in and get 13 soul stones out of it. So we offer up this multitude of heads to the tainted one. So now I should be able to pick up a nice amount of skills next time I use a hexen table. A crimson fodder surprises Marina here. She casts the first black smog, which take out his legs, but not his head or arms. The crimson fodder is equipped with a dagger, but more than that, he can take mind control of one member of your party. So in this case, he was able to mind control Olivia. 
But fortunately, Marina and Abella are able to beat him in the head till he goes down. Walking by a chained coffin, we get surprised when the Death Mask emerges from the coffin. Death Mask are equipped with a large knife in each hand and wear chainmail armor, making them extremely threatening and dangerous. I do not want to fight him, so I whip out the shotgun. He ain't bulletproof. Two hits from the shotgun and he goes down. I loot the body since you can get the death mask, which increases magic damage, and the chainmail, which is decent armor. Another crimson fodder ambushes me, but the black smog took out his legs. So I attack his head and we take him out pretty quickly. So next, I'm going to get everything that we need to summon the Heartless One. First, I need the church keys from this body here. Second, I need to draw a sigil to rare at the church ritual circle. Using the sigil of rare to transport to the other world, we find a cell that can be unlocked with the church keys we just picked up. We find somebody chained up under a mountain of chains held together with a heart-shaped lock. The person does not speak, but we're able to undo the lock with the rusty key. We pick up the heart-shaped lock, which we'll need to summon the Heartless One for the boss fight. Returning to the regular world, we make our way out of the church and back to the street, having finished up our business in the church. We head to Western Bremen, where we find a Bremen elite soldier finishing off the local Moonscorched population. In combat, the trooper defends himself with his shield and attacks with a rifle. His shield is able to raise the defense of all his body parts, dragging the fight out. I focus all my attacks on his rifle arm to stop him from being able to hurt anybody in my party. But his high defense makes it hard to apply damage. So I use Abella's wrench toss ability to stop him from being able to use his rifle arm. The Bremen elite troopers are the Kaiser's protectors. We usually see them protecting him or escort him around the city. And we will see a lot of them in the white bunker. Fighting them does provide some decent mid-game loot if you're able to take them on. Once his rifle arm is disabled, the fight becomes a grind since he still has high defense and health, but each attack only lands a little bit of damage on him. But once his shield is destroyed, his defense drops back down to normal, and finishing the fight is a cakewalk after that. We get the Bremen Elite Helmet and a Bremen chest plate as loot from the fight, both of which are decent pieces of armor. After the fight with the Bremen trooper, we loot the area, collect the heads and the film reel, and then we can head back to the main part of the city. Next, we'll be heading to the orphanage to get the last of the three effigies. But first, on the way, we'll be making a pit stop at the Preheville Bop so I can use the hexen table and also to have another drink. We take a moment to speak to Olivia. She tells us that the club is nice. She's not used to clubs and city life in general, but she's always wanted to experience a place like this. If only it was full of people and full of hustle. As I will have to imagine it for now. Marina tells Olivia when they get out of here, she'll take her to a club. Olivia says that she's looking forward to it and to a dance. We get a Cosmopolitan from Dan. The blend of the cocktail looks immaculate. You have no doubts that the taste will be just as good as you raise the delicate glass on your lips. The freshly squeezed lime presents the dominating sour flavor, but it is balanced masterfully with the sweetness that comes from the triple sec. The liqueur gives the drink a sweet orange flavor. The slight hint of cranberry juice in the background keeps your taste buds guessing as the vodka blends everything together by diluting the most powerful flavors. The taste is fruity, refreshing, and a perfect blend of sweet and sour. After a few more sips, you'd say that the orange-flavored triple sec is the unsung hero of the cocktail. 
The citrus punch really takes the drink to another level. The Cosmo is truly a light drink, dangerously so. You can only tell there was a large amount of vodka in the drink from the slight fuzz in your head as you finish the drink. Dan reminds us that we've had a few drinks already. And remember, life is the best drug. I don't necessarily agree with him, but I appreciate the sentiment. We used the bunk bed to get some rest in order to use the soul stones to unlock more skills. In our dreams, we see the Jester again. Levi and Pav have both perished, leaving nine participants. If you don't intervene, Levi will be killed by Caligura. I have 15 soul stones, so first I unlock both of Samari's skills, which will soon be useful since we're heading to the orphanage. I unlock the rest of Tanaka's skill tree to get plus one defense, attack, magic defense, and magic attack. I unlock Greater Meditation and finish off Osa's skill tree. From Grogoro's Affinity, I unlock Necromancy, Blood Golem, and Black Orb. I still have 5 Soul Stones left. So I unlock Lunar Meteorite, which is unlocked since I've beaten the game before. Reveal Aura, which we won't be using, but is useful for tracking down the Moon Scorch participants and Mind Read, which gives you more insight when talking to other characters. And most importantly, we get plus 25 to Mind Capacity, which will be useful since we're going to be casting a lot of spells. Marina wakes up in the bunk bed in the speakeasy and starts gathering the party again together to prepare for the next part of their adventure. Speaking to Corinne, Marina realizes that she can read her thoughts. Corinne thinks to herself, I think I can take a small break. I've been at it 24-7 for a while now. I should really learn to relax one of these days. Marina approaches Olivia, but she seems nervous. Marina asks if Olivia is nervous about the three-day time limit. Olivia says that she'd be lying if she said that she wasn't worried. Considering the horror in the city, it's obvious that something very abnormal is going on here. What happens when the time limit expires? Are we going to turn into madness as well? Marina can read Olivia's mind as Olivia thinks to herself, I, I don't want this town to be my final resting place. There's still so much I have yet to do. I haven't even fallen in love yet. With the party back together, we head out to the orphanage. The orphanage's playground is still and quiet, waiting ominously as Marina approaches the orphanage. As Marina enters the orphanage, she notices that the air is filled with dread and foreboding, as if many cruel and awful acts happened here. Marina discovers twisted cherubs patrolling the hallways. She pulls out a pistol to put them down. Haunting ghosts of children also patrol these halls walking around as solitary ghosts looking for some form of comfort. Ghost-type enemies can only be hurt by spells or unarmed attacks. They will not be harmed if you're using a weapon to attack them. The halls of the orphanage feel empty and haunted, as this place was supposed to be a place of innocence and joy, but rather it became a recruitment ground for the military when they needed child soldiers and not to mention all the horrors the dark priest carried out on the children. This orphanage was the closest thing that Levi had to a home. Marina and the party continue to explore the orphanage and break down a door to reach the back half of the building. We find a classroom that's barricaded with a door that has a reinforced lock. Using brute force, we break it down. Despite this being a place for children, you feel no joy. In the back of the classroom, Marina discovers an ongoing game of hangman along with a candle and a Ouija board. 
the secret here is that if you want to retrieve the talking board and take it with you, you have to lose the game of Hangman. The secret word is only three letters, so it's actually pretty easy to discover that the word is God, G-O-D. Marina and the group continue to explore the orphanage using the handgun to put down any cherubs and fighting off ghosts, slowly making their way to the head office on the second floor in the back of the building. Exploring the basement, we find more cherubs and a decrepit priest in one of the cells where they used to hold children. Now that we are more capable and better equipped, we deal swift justice to him for his part in tormenting the children. Exploring the classroom, we find a book called The Four Ages of History. The modern age and modern chronology begins from the birth of our Lord, the Ascended One, Almer. The Second Age started from the reign of the so-called New Gods in the year 410. The world order of the New Gods started a slow decline a few hundred years after their death, only to be ended by the Fellowship around the year 800. The popular book The Fellowship inspired the contemporary people of the time and lifted the four people of the Fellowship, Francois, Chambara, Nilvin, and Voltaire to near godlike status. Their age would last until the end of the 16th century. The Western world was in a dark age at the time, and out of nowhere appeared a new idol of worship, the god of fear and hunger. People forgot the teachings of the old in times of disease and death and turned to this new savior. The appearance of the god of fear and hunger started the fourth age in which mankind had to learn to adapt and evolve. As times have progressed, we are still living according to this ideology. We have a stroke of good luck searching this bookcase where we find the skin bible of the god of fear and hunger. We use this skin bible along with the engraved skill to carve sigils of the god of fear and hunger on everybody in the party, increasing their agility. This won't give me an immediate benefit but it's going to be useful for some tough fights up ahead against Perkele and Rare and also the Heartless one. I also equip Abella with the Small Things amulet, so now she also has agility that's 16 or greater and will get two actions per turn in combat. Approaching the head office, there are two ritual circles outside, one to Grogoroth and one to Sylvian. I use both of the skills that I unlocked from Samari's skill tree to level up affinity with Grogoroth but more importantly, Sylvian. I need affinity with Sylvian in order to unlock healing spells. I choose not to fight Father Hugo since there's no real benefit to it. The main time that you absolutely want to make sure you fight Father Hugo is in muscle mode, since he drops the key that you need to unlock the door to use the hexen table here in the orphanage. Using that hexen table will spawn the Gull Brothers. We find a sigil to rare. Taking it transports us to the otherworldly version of the orphanage, which is filled with trenches. Trenches like the ones that the child soldiers recruited out of this orphanage, like Levi, would have been sent to to fight and die, even though they were only children. Throughout these trenches, we see what appears to be human figures made out of mud, representing the lives lost in the Great War. Also in the otherworldly version of the orphanage, we find a lot of Ronteal's monsters as they lie in wait in their holes in the dirt. These monsters have bladed pendulum for arms and large mouths with dozens of teeth as heads and stomachs. When fighting the Ronteal's, you'll want to make it a priority to disable both of their arms since those bladed pendulums are very capable of cutting off limbs off of the characters in your party. While they are dangerous, they aren't too tanky and don't have too much health. Fortunately, the high damage output of the Black Steel, along with Marina's multiple attacks per turn, makes managing them a little bit easier. Fortunately, some spawn without the bladed pendulum arms, but they still pose a threat as they can still bite you. 
but compared to the other types, I'd rather fight these. Approaching the third and final effigy, we pass up another golden door. And at the end of the trench system, we get the hunger effigy, the last effigy that we needed to unlock the passageway in the Church of Almer that would lead us to the endgame areas, so the museum and the tower. We exit Rare's otherworldly dimension and return back to the real world. Walking through the courtyard, we can see that the game of Hangman that we were playing had very real consequences. Wrapping up our business in this part of town, we head to the Church of Almer. We place each of the three effigies in front of their corresponding stained glass window. The Fellatio, Hunger, and the Martyr effigies. Placing all three effigies causes a tunnel to reveal itself in the floor. Entering it, we find a secret tunnel that runs underneath the church. We're going to come up on a series of barricades where we have to choose to open either the left one or the right one. Each cell will have a different challenge or a different monster. For no particular reason, the first time I played, I chose both times to open the cell on the right. And that's what I've done ever since. And I don't have a good reason for it. It just worked once and I kept doing it. Since I've gotten this comment on a lot of my videos, I'd like to add that the snail from the Crimson Fodder kind of looks like Gary from Spongebob Squarepants. So the challenge in the first cell is a singular Crimson Fodder. After we defeat him, we'll get access to the second barricade where we will again choose the cell on the right. This time we're confronted by a pillar man. In the lore, the pillar men are tied to the columns inside the Church of Almer. Their wailing and screaming will provide a harmony or a serenade for the believers below in the church pews. The secret to fighting them is targeting their abs. Their abs have six sections. One of the ab sections will have a small face protruding out of it. Once destroyed, the pillar man will very quickly suffocate and the fight will be over. But before we're able to enter the last area of the map, we have one last challenge, Rancid the Sergo, also known as Nekokone Magnificat. The naming of Sergo is a homage to YouTuber Neku the Sergo, who was one of the first people to do a full let's play of Fear and Hunger and help drive a lot of attention to the game. First, we'll have to cross Mausoleum Alley. A Belland type enemy drops down from the roof, but we don't have to fight him. We enter a large hall with a massive statue. You see multiple eyes glowing in the darkness above. Find that Rancid has been observing us from above. He drops down to attack. Rancid is a fierce and capable warrior. He says that his name is the last one you'll hear before heads start to roll. His blood is rushing wild. While Rancid is a serious threat and dangerous, this fight can be ended quickly. The secret is that Rancid will disengage once you destroy one of his limbs. So I use the Bella's wrench toss to stun one arm and then focus all damage on the other one. I don't finish the fight in one turn, but I get lucky as Rancid's throwing spear misses. For the extra turns, Marina will continue attacking the same arm and Abella will equip her wrench again. Abella now also has two actions per turn since she now has the sigil of the God of Fear and Hunger and has the Small Things amulet equipped. Fortunately, on her next attack, Marina lands a critical hit with the Black Steel. Having lost the limb, Rancid disengages from combat. He calls us a bastard and says that he doesn't deal with the likes of us. He then announces that we are not the one that he is after. Humans shouldn't be meddling with things that, that they don't understand. And that's why the forces of the moon are so chaotic. Humans are leeching on the moon and that's why so much random stuff is happening. Doppelgangers replacing missing folk, old deities rising up from their graves, space and time tearing up. The forces are desperately trying to fix the balance because of humanity. 
Fine by me. More challengers for me to be head, says Rancid. I'm off. Don't even bother tainting my blade with your blood. Pick up the Sergo spear from the severed arm of the Sergo, which I'm going to have Abella equip, since she can use two-handed weapons and will be able to attack twice per turn. With that, we make it to the temple site, and we pass up a lantern that appears to be a homage to Bloodborne. We circle back and unlock a shortcut back to the center of Perheville, which helps make navigation a little bit easier. This is where we saw the Kaiser at the beginning of the game. Here we encounter the very creatively named Belen type of enemy, because it resembles, well, you can figure it out. And I hope I pronounced that correctly. This monster has an ability that raises its defense, a lot like the shield on the Bremen Elite Trooper. Fortunately, Abella lands a critical hit on the arm with the spear. Since she has the Leechmonger ring, attacking enemies also heals her. Not too far away, we will find Donovan's house. Cobwebs slowly wave in the corner as you enter the building. From the mess of things, it looks like this house has been abandoned. There's papers scattered everywhere, and everything is still in boxes. We also find a lot of piles of books. Similarly to the Preheville Bob, Donovan's house functions as a kind of safe house. You can open a blood portal here, and you'll also find the only hexen table that you can use without resting. But we'll be back here soon enough once we've traded with Pocket Cat and have the Skin Bible of Almer, which allows us to open the blood portals. Once the blood portals are open, you can instantly warp between the Perheville Bob, the train, and Donovan's house. If you had save Henrik and Dan, it would mean that you can save, level up by unlocking skills at the Hexen table, refill your mind meter with Dan at the bar, and refill your hunger meter with Henrik. So it does kind of become like a safe spot where you can regroup and heal, and also swap out party members. Another Betland monster jumps off the roof and ambushes us. Fortunately, since using the Spice Forge kinda counts like a turn, and with greater occultism, you start with two rev points. It means that on your first action, Marina will have three rev points she can use to do more damage and have two attacks on the first turn. And with Marina having the Black Steel and Abella using the Sergo Spear, I'm getting pretty good damage output. Since the Belen use Harden, I'm going to use magic attacks with Marina, trying to get around his increased defense while everybody else in the party continues attacking and gradually chipping away at his health. Fighting these guys can be a little bit of a grind since their defenses take so many turns to break through. With one arm, he can still do a choking attack, but at least he's lost the ability to do spear attacks. But over the turns, we keep applying damage, and eventually, he's not a problem anymore. We head a little bit to the north and we arrive at the museum where we will encounter a mysterious ball filled with people frozen in place as if this were an eternal party where everybody is dressed up with Venetian style mask. All the party goers appear frozen as if this were a snapshot of an actual celebration frozen in time. Speaking to them causes no reaction or movement. The hallways in the museum are confusing, seemingly wrapping around themselves in a way that doesn't seem possible twisting, turning, and looping back into itself, where you can start walking down one hall and then end up behind you, as if you had gone in a circle by walking in a straight line, kind of like a Mobius strip or a structure that exists in higher dimensionality. Making our way among the colorfully dressed but still partygoers, we loot the museum since there can be some pretty good items, weapons, and armor here. Marina finds a series of displays of historical items, including an effigy of the God of Fear and Hunger. A display shows a samurai armor from the Kingdom of Edo. 
a traditional body armor that was typically worn by the warrior class of Yansa or Yuanban. The cuirass consists individual leather and or iron scales that are connected to each other with leather or silk lace depending on the era. We cannot loot this armor and become Samurai Marina. Maybe there will be content for a later patch or installment in the series. The armor is a great example of two cultures of Edo and the Eastern Sanctuaries melting together. During the 8th century, Eastern Sanctuaries led multiple campaigns against the Kingdom of Edo, but each one proved out to be a fruitless endeavor. The Sultan of the Eastern Sanctuaries, Nasra the Great, did have a certain respect for his adversaries and acknowledged the warring arts of Edo that were highly developed in the isolation of an island nation. Since he was unable to make the warring arts his own by conquering the kingdom and forcing it under his rule, he instead formed a brand new country inside the borders of the eastern sanctuaries. Making a new country, super easy, barely an inconvenience. He appointed the high status war prisoners from Edo as the central figures of this new country and ordered them to mimic the ways of Edo as closely as possible and breed a warrior class for the eternal kingdom that was the eastern sanctuaries. This didn't happen overnight, but rather took hundreds of years. But ultimately, the eastern sanctuaries did get what Nazra wanted. The warrior class, Jizamurai, was born in the Yansa Aryuanban. I'm pretty sure I mispronounced something there. But generally speaking, the phonetics of Japanese and Spanish are kinda similar. So if you pronounce the vowel similar, you kinda get pretty close. Marina walks by a few more displays with the owl cultist mask and also the bunny mask and the wolf mask from the first Fear and Hunger. Not far, we find three displays connected with the alarm system. Breaching any one of these will cause the alarm system to lock down the other two. The items are a greatsword, the Yangetsu amulet, and a chak chak. If you are quick though, it is possible to grab two of the three items. Next to these is the fluted breastplate, which we can use to make the fluted armor set, which protects all your limbs, has decent defense, but does bring your agility down. A statue to Betel has a plaque that reads, mythological figure known as Betel the Enlightened One. The famed new god who formed the great libraries in the city of the gods, where every one of his successors would gather their knowledge and fill the library shelves with books from all forms of expertise. Generally viewed as the father of enlightenment among the new gods and the one who wrote about the human dilemma. It is widely believed that the mythical figure is based on Bethel Kishar, one of the more popular scholars of ancient Mesopotamia. The Grand Library that was mentioned is one of the major locations from the first game. It's where we encounter Valtel, the Enlightened One. At long last, we encounter Pocket Cat, waiting in this corner of the museum, standing in front of a large Pablo Picasso-style painting. Pocket Cat greets us like an old friend saying, Old sport, fancy seeing you here as well. I hope that you are enjoying the ball. Surely you are. To which Marina replies that it's strange. To which Pocket Cat replies, Ain't it so? Ain't it so? People are strange when you're a stranger. If you want a break from the sea of party people, luckily there are plenty of distractions to examine. I can't but help to wander this lovely building and admire the work of art they've gathered here. There are truly remarkable pieces here. Catman continues, Art falls into two categories. No, not the art, my bad. Artists fall into two categories. There are the ones who see something taking place in the world. Maybe it's wrongdoing of their fellow pedestrians. Maybe it's abuse of power by those sitting on top of the pyramid scheme. Whatever it is, it feeds their inspiration and creativity and they desperately want to put their own spin on it. It must be very spontaneous, I imagine, painting a picture in an inspired frenzy or composing a piece of music that beats in sync with the world. I call these people extroverted artists. Then there are the other half of poor sods, the ones who dwell in their own thoughts and insight. They want to paint a picture of their inner world, 
maybe in hopes that someone else would understand them a little bit better, or maybe to connect with a few like-minded individuals. Maybe these artists would want to depict the pictures of times as well, but only if the event taking place would strike a chord with the monologue they are having with the world. I call these people introverted artists. Both sound selfish in their own right. The extroverted artists who benefit from the suffering of others, while introverted artists on the other hand sound very self-centered only wanting to talk about themselves. Now that I think about it, there might be a third type, favorite kind actually. Authors who don't even have a clear picture in their mind when they start their creative process. They let the story write itself, let the brush strokes dictate the direction of the story instead trying to force their own will on it. Such chaotic process can lead to unexplored directions. Inspiration can be a chaotic process, don't you think? Seo Sport, the one who dreams all this, the dreamer buried deep underground. He says referring to the machine god waiting for us in the white bunker. What type do you think she is? To which Marina replies, the third type. To which Meow Meow Man replies, Ah, I let my bias shine through and you followed on it. Still, I think you might be right there, my friend. But enough about that. Are you here to do some business, perhaps? This is what I have to offer. It is quite a nice collection, even if I say so myself. So we trade some of the contestant heads that we've collected for the skin bible of Almer, which will at long last allow us to open the blood portals. Before wrapping up at the museum, we also pick up the fluted arm pieces that we'll need to craft the armor. And with that, we start making our way back to the city center, unlocking a shortcut from this area back to close to where the Prehevo Bop is. And finally, I open the blood portal here. I start heading back to Old Town, opening more blood portals on the way. So we still have a few more things to knock out before the end game, and to make sure that we're setting ourselves up for both endings. So we still need to activate the last teletroscope station in the deep woods, and we need to start eliminating the other participants. So for that, I start heading back to the mayor's mansion. Entering the mansion, we see Jeeves, the mayor's weird butler. He tells us that there's a new mayor in town, and we can find him upstairs in the dining room. Entering the room, the mayor says, Newcomer, new comes, then the new goes. Just in time for dinner. We're not here for pleasantries, so we get down to business and attack him. The gentleman rises from the table to confront you. The first black smog does manage to take out both of his legs, but he still has both of his arms that he can attack us with. Fortunately, the high attack of the Black Steel, along with Marina being able to attack twice on the first turn, takes out the arm of his that's holding the fork. And Olivia, with an axe attack, takes out the other arm. With the Sergo Spear, Abella delivers a hit to the head that ends the fight. And Marina absorbed the suffocated soul, and we finally get the other key to the gate to the city that we in no way need anymore. Also, since we're here, we return to this ritual circle that we mentioned at the very beginning of the video, the first time we were here in the mayor's mansion. We use the skin bible of Venushka to draw Venushka's sigil on the ritual circle. This causes a tree to suddenly spawn on top of the ritual circle. Returning to this secret alcove, we find that the roots provide another way down to the basement, which leads us to this locked room. This room is filled with purple sacks that kind of resemble the ones we had to pierce in the Dungeon of Fear and Hunger to get access to the God of the Depths and the Gauntlet. Also down here, we get the third and last piece that we need to craft the fluted armor. The fluted armor will be an essential part of being able to overcome some of the harder fights up ahead. It has decent armor, but more importantly, it can protect your limbs from dismemberment without taking up an accessory slot. Since the other way to prevent dismemberment is to equip arm guards or the Salmon Snake Ruin, both of which take up an accessory slot. 
The downside to the armor is that it lowers your agility by 5, but that can be offset by using the pep pills. Next, I'll head back to the Church of Armor to open the blood portal, and after that, I'll return to the train to open the blood portal there as well. This way, I'll be able to move around from the very end game to the start of the game using the portals, just saving me a lot of time walking. Although the blood portals would have been a lot more useful if I had found the, the skin bible of Almer earlier on in the game. Here we pass by Marco the Boxer again, and open the blood portal from where we started the game. Now I have my blood super highway complete, although I don't open the portal at the bookstore since I don't really find myself needing to go back there at this point in the game. Anywhere I may want to go is just closer to a different blood portal. Back in Donovan's house, I use the Hexen table to unlock some more skills. From Almer's tree, I unlock defense plus one to get more physical resistance. But I don't use up all my soul stones, since I'm going to need them once I start absorbing even more of the other participants' souls. I use the Blood Portal Superhighway to warp back to the train cabin. We're going to be taking the ladder shortcut that we lowered for ourselves earlier in the video. I need to go back to the deep forest. There is one more bunker there that has the last telescope station that we need to activate to get access to the white bunker and the logic. Though one serious threat stands in our way. The centaur is guarding the entrance to the bunker. The centaur is a unique enemy that appears to be a marriage between a person and a horse. The centaur's opening attack will always be the devastating stampede where he attacks everybody in the party for high damage. Fortunately, luck is on our side and he mostly misses. So as per usual, I use the ref points with Marina to start off with two attacks. And I have everybody in the party focus damage on the same leg. Once one of his legs is disabled, he can no longer do the stampede attack, switching him from attacking everybody in the party to only attacking one person in the party. I also deploy a gasoline canister to get some AOE damage and hurt all the limbs. Marina lands a critical hit and with two strikes delivers 2300 damage, though the centaur does manage to stun her. Fortunately, the fire from the gasoline canister is applying a nice bit of damage, and next turn, Abella, Karin, and Olivia all have three ref points, so they'll be able to attack twice. Before long, his four legs are disabled, and it won't take too much more to put the centaur down especially if Marina crits twice in a row. With the centaur out of the way, we enter the secret bunker in the deep forest here. We once again have a vision of Rayla and blue moths. I loot all these lockers here real quick. And a few paces down, we find a freshly severed arm, a soul job, a bone saw, and even more limbs just laying on the ground. It's almost like somebody has been experimenting with human body parts, making monsters out of these improvised and attached human limbs like Frankenstein's monster. Marina didn't want to think about what type of human experimentation had been happening here. It's not long before Marina and the rest stumble upon the result of another human experiment, the lump of flesh. Not wanting to get close to that thing, Marina aims her rifle at it and pulls the trigger. After a surprising amount of bullets, the lump of flesh stops moving and is finally still. The world was better with that thing dead. Marina continues to explore the bunker, and it's not long at all before she finds even more human experiments. She didn't want to think if those things were still conscious or not. Or was it still a person? A disheveled, disfigured woman that resembled needles made her way towards Marina and the group. This was Needles, the reanimated corpse of Dan's late fiancé, who had been carrying out all these experiments on the human body, creating the abominations we've been fighting. 
In the back end of the bunker, we find a generator that we pour fuel into and power on in order to get electricity to the elevators. Marina continues her descent, taking the elevator down to a deeper level of the bunker. It's in this level where Marina will find a bench grinder, the component needed to make the meat grinder, a very powerful melee weapon that's craftable with a Bella's weapon craft skill. This is the only bench grinder that can be found at a fixed location, since the other ones can be found by fighting the mob or stealing from a Bella. Usually, you'll end up in Bunker 1 pretty late in the game, but it is possible to get the bench grinder early on. If you're able to sneak into the city, make it to West Preheville, and then head south into the deep forest and dodge the centaur. But then you'll still need the weapons craft skill, so you'll either have to get a Bella's soul or play as a Bella to get the weapons craft skill. Although, on this playthrough, since we'll be fighting the heartless one, in the end, I'll end up not using the meat grinder as much and go for the red virtue instead. Approaching the telescope station, we see Rayla's blue moths again. Activating it means we've activated all three of the underground telescope stations that we need to unlock the blast doors to enter the white bunker. With our business concluded in the bunker, we head back to the surface. So now the path to the end game is open. In this video, we will be doing ending A against the Machine God and ending B going up against Rayer in the Moon Tower. And we'll be doing this by getting one ending and then just reloading the save and going for the other one. So next, I'll just be wrapping things up and getting the last things that I need before attempting the end game. So that includes getting all the skills and items that I need. And I'll also be going up against the last tough enemies and bosses that I haven't yet. So that's the second Sergo fight, Pocket Cat, the fight against the Heartless One, and the Tormented One. Regrettably, this is the part of the run where Marina takes a turn for evil and realizes that the only way she'll be able to overcome all of these challenges is by turning against the other participants and absorbing their souls. So if you don't want to see the part where I have to take down the other participants, please feel free to skip ahead a few minutes. So everybody is led back to the Preheville Bop where Marina will be making her move. Since Marina has endgame gear, and all the other participants will only use their starting items when they fight against you, Marina very clearly has a serious upper hand. The fights are pretty straightforward and ended quickly. Initially, I only wanted to take down Olivia and Abella, since I need the toxicology skill from Olivia and the weapon scrap skill from Abella. And here I'm reminded of one mechanic I've overlooked. Certain participants will stand up to you and restrain you if they see you attacking other participants for no reason. Having attacked Olivia in front of Dan, Dan grabs you. He doesn't seem so strong, but he has his fingers on your nerves and it forces you to stay put. What a mess you've made, he says. You've done stupid now, haven't you? At this point, you are restrained and the only option you have is to wait until the evening of the last day, which doesn't work out for our plans, so I reload the game and try again. So this time, I will also be taking out Dan, since he's the one that restrained me last time. So on my second attempt, I go up against Dan before fighting Olivia. Starting the fight, Dan says, let's slice and dice, no? I thought that was something you said at a moment like this. The first black smog spell ends the fight quickly. This time though, Corinne intervenes to stop our murderous rampage. Corinne's got you in her sights. The pistol on her hand doesn't seem to shake in the slightest. She seems very determined. Don't move an inch, she says. I have no problem pulling the trigger. So I reload once again. And this time, I will be going for all four of the participants that are in the Preheve Bop with me. Be careful when you stare into the abyss, for the abyss might stare back. After Marina completes her heinous act, she is ready to become a monster strong enough to take out the other monsters here in Preheve. Having absorbed all of the souls, we make our way to Donovan's house to use the Hexen Table to unlock our newly available skills. Of the skills that I unlock, the most impactful one will be the Toxicology skill from Olivia's tree, 
which allows me to pick up hemlock and craft condensed hemlock, which is one of the most powerful items in the game. And since I have the soul stone, I unlock a few other skills that should make the rest of the game just a little bit easier. So then I put Abella's weapon craft skill to good use and make the weapons that it unlocks, although I ended up not really needing them. And then I make my way back to the outskirts of the city to collect hemlock. Condensed hemlock in hand, I am now ready to go up against the heartless one. Once summoned, she challenges the player to a one-on-one -on -one duel. So this is the first major challenge against the heartless one. You have to fight her alone without the help, additional damage, and attacks from having a full party on your side. The heartless one makes her appearance. She will rise out of the formed pool of blood. She appears as a horned woman with long white hair, wearing a black form-fitting bodysuit. In one hand, she is holding the sword, the red virtue, and in her other hand, she holds a trident that she uses to cast a blinding magical attack on the player. After a couple of turns, she will sprout wings that she can also use to attack you with the feather rain attack. The duel with the heartless one is a brutal and unrelenting battle to the point that it is difficult to even survive her opening attack. Surviving even one turn will take planning and preparation since she will unleash a multi-attack barrage every turn. Each turn, she will attack in the following pattern. First, a soul strike attack from her sword, the Red Virtue, striking twice and having a chance to dismember. The second attack will be a Pillar of Light casted from her trident. The Pillar of Light attack has a chance of inflicting the Light Sensitivity status effect on you, which will lower the player's attack hit rate, making landing physical damage more difficult. After both of these initial attacks, she'll make a comment about testing how tough you really are, and then she'll unleash her Blood Rose Assault attack on you, which attacks for 4 hits. If the Blood Rose Assault attack connects and manages to damage you, the spilled blood from the attack will attract the blood rose vines which will grab the player decreasing agility and causing even more damage after a few turns she will spread her wings and she will gain an additional attack similar to the one perkele uses in ending b attacking the player with a rain of feathers so each turn the heartless one will hit with four or five attacks and some of those attacks will hit multiple times the combination of these attacks can very easily drain the player's entire health bar in just one turn. On top of the raw damage, each turn she'll have a chance to inflict light sensitivity, dismember the player, inflict the bleed status, and also lower your agility, possibly taking away your extra turn. In order to prevail against her, the player will have to counter or negate all of these effects meaning that the fight will take extensive and specific preparation and gear. First, in order to prevent dismemberment, you'll want some gear to protect your limbs, like the Salmon Snake Ruin or the Fluted Armor. The Salmon Snake Ruin is a random drop, so there's luck involved in getting it. The Fluted Armor can be pieced together from parts collected from the museum and the mayor's mansion, but at the cost of lowering agility. The Light Sensitivity status can be offset by relying on magical attacks or using items and status effects. Also wearing eyeglasses can help offset the loss of accuracy. One thing I found vital in winning the fight against the Heartless One is having two actions per turn, meaning having 16 agility or more, which can be a challenge since the Fluted Armor and the Blood Rose Vines will both lower your agility so you'll have to buff your agility a lot to offset both of these effects using the pep pills, the engrave skill, and the small things amulet. I recommend having at least 21 agility going into the fight, so that when lowered, it comes down to 16 agility, preserving having two actions per turn. I experimented with the Spice Forge to see what would be the best spell to auto-cast as soon as the fight started. The Spice Forge has a very powerful ability, allowing you to auto-cast one spell as soon as the combat encounter starts. First, I tried the Black Smog, 
but it wouldn't deal significant damage nor blind her. Black Orb and Hurting would attack a random limb, but it wouldn't deal any game-changing damage. Eventually, I settled on using the Blood Golem spell to start the fight, since he could act as a decoy for the Heartless One. During the fight, what I found worked was to use your first turn to guard. This will mitigate some of the damage from her barrage of attacks and then take an action on your second turn, assuming that you're not healing. As you can see from the footage, I tried over and over again, but I wasn't able to output enough damage to make any significant progress. So in the end, what worked for me and the Marina build I was using on this run was to first auto summon the Blood Golem at the start of the fight and then use guard as your first action. Hopefully you don't take too much damage and on your second action, you can use a condensed hemlock on her torso. The Heartless one does have a large HP pool, but the damage the condensed hemlock does is ridiculous. Once you used the condensed hemlock on her, all you have to do is survive and let the poison do its work. On the next turn, guard for your first action and then heal on the second. Keep repeating this until the Heartless One has taken enough damage to her torso and the fight should be done in a few turns. Once she has taken enough damage, only her injured torso will remain, at which point you can continue attacking, guarding, and healing for a few more turns, and then before long, the fight should be over. Upon defeat, the Heartless One will vanish before you. She will drop the Red Virtue, a high damage sword that attacks twice per turn and the darkness, a high defense armor that also increases your agility. Both of these pieces of gear are fantastic and will make the rest of the run a lot easier. Having defeated the Heartless One, we move on to our next encounter, which is the rematch with Rancid the Sergal. After encountering him in the secret tunnel in the Church of Almer, we can find him in a little alcove in the Maiden Forest. Encountering him, he says, a new challenger? No, just you again. This puny little critter right here posed absolutely no challenge. I'm looking for the champion of these lands. My bloodthirst is yet to be satiated. So how about it? A duel to the death? This time there is no escape. The last man standing is a champion of Prehevel. Good, I knew I saw the beast in your eyes. Let's do this, says Rancid. Round two, Rancid says, when the combat encounter begins. See this spear? It's the very same that beheaded that half-god over there. What do you reckon it would do to soft human skin? The fight starts and Marina casts first Black Smog and then uses the Red Viper, which attacks twice per turn on his remaining arm. And I also use my Rev Points for a total of four attacks, which takes out his remaining arm in one turn, seriously reducing his damage output and threat. So for the next few turns, I will concentrate all damage on his torso, and before too long, the fight is over and Rancid the Sergal has been beaten in combat. Also, since I have the Leechmonger ring equipped, every time Marina attacks, she heals, and since we're doing such high damage output, the healing's pretty significant. Now Rancid lies dead next to the demigod that he put down just before we got here. We get a second Sergo Spear as loot, but we won't be needing it. And we also collect his head as a trophy of this honorable duel between us. Now, in order to go up against a tormented one, we make our way back to the center of the city. Right now, I wish I had unlocked the blood portal at the bookstore since it would have been the closest blood portal I could have used to get the crow that I need to summon the tormented one, but I hadn't opened it. So, lesson learned. While making my way through the city, I decide to test out my new weapons, armor, and skills and see how Marina fares on one-on-one -on -one fights with the Bobbies. As a way to compare how much stronger Marina is now than at the start of the festival. So I encounter a remaining Bobby in the center of the city. Fortunately, the first black smog takes out his three arms and one leg, paving the way for an easy victory. 
After that, using the Rev and the Red Viper gives me 4 attacks, which I concentrate on the torso, ending the fight with the Bobby in just one turn. And we can see that Marina is immensely more powerful than when she started just a few days ago. Since we're here, we poke our head into this hotel near the bookstore. There's a few areas in the game that I think hint that more content will be added, the hotel being one of them, since other than a few containers that have random loot, there's really not much more here. In terms of gameplay and storytelling, I'm not sure what the purpose is of making this area accessible. We see that the staircase has collapsed, so I wonder if a later content update will fix the stairs and add some more lore or storytelling maybe in this hotel. I also wonder what's the purpose of indicating that the grandfather clock has stopped working and it's stuck at 2.35. But back to what we were doing, we make it back to the bookstore and open up the last blood portal to have them all available to us. In the center of the city, we find a dead crow that's partially decomposed already. This item is needed to summon the Tormented One, the new god, Ron Shambara from Part 1. So with this dead bird in hand, we make our way back to the Church of Almer to summon him. You put the offering on the center of the circle. The air cools down becomes thicker, it feels heavy just to breathe. The Tormented One rises out slowly from a pool of blood. Marina stares at this new god for a minute before starting the encounter. Without a word, the Tormented One walks towards you. The combination of the first black smog, the ability of the Red Virtue to attack twice, and Marina's skills, which allow her to start with three rev points, makes for an extremely effective opening attack against the Tormented One. After the first turn, the chains of torment sprout out of the Tormented One's shoulders. And also, fortunately, the Black Smog has managed to blind him, lowering his accuracy. The Leechmonger Ring is also put to good use since it's healing Marina as she attacks nullifying the effect of the Tormented One's attacks. Chambara uses the Chains of Torment on me, but fortunately, due to his being blind, they missed. With both of his arms gone, I'm going to focus all damage on his torso, hoping to end the fight. And luck is on my side, since he does miss a few more attacks. A few more turns of this, and the Tormented One goes down. And Marina manages to heal herself completely by the end of the fight. Defeating the Tormented One doesn't really change anything, and he doesn't really drop any loot, so I think this fight is mostly just an easter egg for fans of the first game. Marina beats the body of the Tormented One. The body of the Tormented One feels sturdy after his seeming death. Blood seeps from the exposed flesh with each kick. Okay, so one more notable enemy to go after before the end game. Since Dan has already died, the fight with Pocket Cat is no longer available in this run through. But let's see what would have happened if Dan had Moon Scorched and we had gone up against Pocket Cat. Fighting Pocket Cat is unlike any other encounter in Termina. Being a creature of the trickster moon god, Rare, he is bound to not interfere in the festival. The way that he's going to get around this is only hurting you in ways that you direct him to. During the fight, he'll ask you if you want him to sever an arm, a leg, or your head. If you tell him to take your head, the game will predictably end. So the only viable options are to choose arms and legs. So this begins a race against time to finish the fight before you and your party run out of limbs. One thing that will make the fight easier is that he has a very low evasion on his head, making it easier to apply damage to it. Talking to him during combat will reveal some interesting lore and details. He mentions a feeling of deja vu, memories of Termina, and if we've done this before, again, suggesting Pocket Cat has memories of interacting with you in Fear and Hunger 1. 
and him having memories of earlier pocket meow meows. Also, it's a possible homage to Legend of Zelda's Majora's Mask. He also ponders how stories organically change over generations, like a story being told over a game of telephone over time, with little bits of the story changing with each telling until it no longer resembles the original. This makes me wonder if this is a reference to how the books, the tales of Pocket Cat, are different between Fear and Hunger 1 and 2. If you have the mind read skill, you get one last interesting tidbit. After letting you know that he can read your mind as well, he asks you to stick your hand in his pocket while he pats himself on the back. He probably just needs help reaching his keys. Killing him, you'll get the blank soul, a silk vest, and a scapel, revealing that this version of Pocket Cat is Dan already having been moon scorched. On that note, let's talk about Dan's relationship to Pocket Cat. During his backstory, we learn that Rare has had his eye on Dan since he started his investigation into the occult. Rare, becoming concerned that Dan might learn about the old gods and the supernatural, sends Pocket Cat to derail his studies and try to prevent Dan from learning about the Sulphur God. Dan also has a special moon scorching animation where we see Pocket Cat very creepily loom over Dan, pushing him to embrace the mask and the vest and to become the next Pocket Cat. The fact that Dan has a blank soul suggests that he would be the best candidate on whom to impose the spirit of Pocket Cat. Dan can truly say that Pocket Cat is the cat man inside of him. Traversing the Golden Gates and Accessing the secret door in the black hallway, we reach Pocket Cat's secret room. In this room, we will see a collection of toys and burlap sacks. It's safe to assume these are children that Pocket Cat has hunted down along with their toys. We see a doll, a jack in a box, a baby blight doll, the peculiar doll, along with what could be Dorothy, the lion, the tin man, and the wicked witch of the west. The presence of the peculiar doll suggests that the body of the little girl might be in this room. Since the events of both games are separated by hundreds of years, this tells us Pocket Cat might exist on a point outside of time, possibly a reference to a similar place in Chrono Trigger. On the third day of the festival, once Dan has moon scorched and turned to Pocket Cat, this room will change form. We will see a scene that might be the death of Dan's deceased fiance. Elise. So what is Pocket Cat's goal and purpose? Rare is a jealous god and doesn't believe that humanity deserves the same right and status as gods. So Rare has created agents to stop humanity from ascending to godhood. Pocket Cat, along with the Lady of the Moon, are sent to Earth to hunt for any children that might have divine origin and possibly ascend to godhood in order to stop this from happening. This is the reason why both the lady and the purple kitten will be interested in trading with you in exchange for the little girl in order to prevent her from becoming a new god and transforming into the god of fear and hunger. And with that, we finish all the encounters that I wanted to make sure that we got to before attempting the end game. Now we have all the skills that we need and all the weapons that we need. Although, I still could use some healing spells. So for my next steps, I'm going to use Samuri skill on the Ritual Circle in order to increase my affinity for Sylvian. And after that, I'm going to go back to the Hexen table and unlock a couple of healing spells. At the Hexen table in Donovan's house, I unlock Loving Whispers so that I at least have one healing spell on hand in case I need it. Afterwards, I head back to Old Town, where I resurrect Joni, the soldier whose letter we read a little bit earlier on in the video. Just as he served his nation as a soldier in life, he will serve Marina in death. Meow Meow seems blissfully ignorant about the pain and suffering it has gone through. Shamelessly, he scratches his groin area. I equip my new ghoul with armor to make him a little more resilient in combat and better able to absorb hits. Afterwards, I head back to the Preheville Bop and I have the goat join the party again. 
before heading to the White Bunker, where we will be fighting the Machine God, or the Logic, to get Ending A, I want to see how Marina holds up on her own with the current setup in combat against a couple more enemies, so I head to the sewers, looking for a fight. The first monster type we encounter is a neighbor creature, which we fought before, so it will be a good gauge to see how far along Marina has come. The Spice Forge auto summons a golem as the first move in the fight, and Marina's opening barrage of four attacks with the Red Virtue just melts the neighbor's HP. I proceed to the ghoul encampment in the sewers to continue seeing how I hold up in combat. And I did switch the first skill from the Spice Forge from the Blood Golem to Black Smog. It doesn't take long to realize that using the first Black Smog as an opening attack, followed by a four attack barrage of the Red Virtue and using the Rev Points is a devastating combo that will take down most enemies in the game in one turn. With my curiosity satiated, we can now head to the Preheville Museum and go for ending A. Marina makes her way through the well-dressed but frozen partygoers with a corpse and a goat in tow. Solving the astronomical clock puzzle will grant us access to the underground. Just as a note or a curiosity, the astronomical clock is inspired by the real clock in downtown Prague. Marina enters a large room with a big excavator and an even bigger hole tunneling straight down underground to beneath the museum. Marina uses the improvised ladders to climb down underground. Nothing but engulfing darkness awaits you below. She wondered what would compel the Bremen army to expend so many resources digging this deep underground. The bunker muffles all outside sound. Approaching a console next to a large blast door, Marina sees some blue moths again leading the way. She activates the console and enters the white bunker. This bunker held the Kaiser's secrets and his secret experiments with the machine god. Glass door just closed behind you. This dark bunker just became your tomb. The goat would never again see the outside world. And yet he still pushed on. Slowly but surely, Marina navigates the concrete halls of this odd looking bunker. And it's not long before she encounters one of the Bremen elite troopers. Marina uses the first black smog and the trooper responds by increasing his defenses. And the face mask protects the trooper from going blind. The increased defense that the trooper has does protect him from the damage that Marina can dish out. But after a couple of rounds, she's able to break through his defenses and take out his rifle arm. After that, we keep applying damage to take down his shield and lower his defenses. After that, the fight is trivial. With just a few more attacks, the trooper goes down. I get a little too confident and rush into the storage room where a flame trooper was standing not too far. Reloading the game, I continue my descent down into the white bunker, crossing the first of the two large chasms that gives us a glimpse of the enormity of what we are dealing with here. On the second subfloor in the white bunker, we see what appears to be rows and rows of data banks this is what all the telescope stations were connecting to, and it's also the storage of all the data that the machine god or the logic has stored. We make our way past the guards to continue our descent down to the third level of the white bunker. Crossing the second of the chasms, we see two colossal hands in the dim darkness far away. Reaching the third level of the bunker, we've reached the end. Next, we will encounter the three boss gauntlet that will lead us to ending A. The first of the three encounters is versus the platoon and commander, also known as the Sylvian trooper. The mass army officer gives you a flirtatious smile and seductively waves you to follow her.
The initial black smog hurts everything a little bit but doesn't really have a significant effect. Marina's opening attack with the red virtue and with three rev points takes out the commander on the first turn, leaving just a confused platoon. The platoon has a lot of health, so I use a condensed hemlock to help me take him down. I continue attacking him while the poison does his work. The platoon does manage to get one coin flip attack in, which if I fail would lead to an insta kill, but fortunately luck is on our side this time. A few more rounds and the platoon goes down. Marina continues into the darkness of the white bunker. Soon she'll be face to face with the Kaiser, the king in yellow, who was once previously Legard, mercenary captain of the Midnight Suns. Darkness surrounds Marina from all directions. Marina's head hurts. She feels like she's losing her mind. She has a vision, the same one from the beginning of the game, where she's in a massive hall filled with giant avatars of the new gods that have faded into the past. The death of innocence, the birth of a god, the cogs of fear and hunger are turning on a scale you could not understand. And Marina is about to perceive events not meant for human eyes. Manity sheds its skin. And through all of this, the brave goat never once wavers in his determination to help Marina see this through. Marina experiences another head-screeching headache and her vision fades. Before moving on to the encounter with the Kaiser, Lagarde, let's take a moment and learn about his history and how this man from the medieval period ended up being the Kaiser of the Bremen Empire, waging a one-man war against the old gods, bringing to life a new god, the machine god, the logic. At the beginning of the narrative, we learn of a charming, beautiful, charismatic, and capable young mercenary leader, Lagarde, and his mercenary band, the Knights of the Midnight Sun. Having started as one of many small upstart mercenary bands, hoping to strike it big and become rich off of royal mercenary contracts. Old prophecies talked about a golden hair leader that would be able to join the common folk of the nation in a peaceful revolution and lead them to a golden era without war or famine. Lagarde had interested himself in studying these prophecies and gradually started believing them, which then also led him to become interested in the occult and the stories of ancient horrors that dwelled in the dungeon. Little by little, he became an obsessed man, losing interest in the plight of everyday men and women of the kingdom that he had set out to help at first. He lost interest in the people that the prophecy said he was supposed to shepherd into a golden era. Becoming more interested in the works and the stories of so many men and women that came before him that had sought power greater than that of kings and queens, power beyond the grasp and understanding of our human experience. He became interested in the stories of men and women who had had the audacity and the gall to stand up and try to take some of the power of the old gods and take it for themselves. The stories of men and women that use this power in a doomed attempt to strike back at the old gods. Lagarde started seeing himself as a prophesied one that would unite the land and the people. He started to believe that he must seek power for himself at all cost. That it was his birthright to ascend and become a god. His studies into the occult would cause him to lead an assault and invade Odegrad to the north, baffling most of his closest advisors. In particular, one of his lead and loyal knights, Darcy Catalyst, who had protested his launching this expedition up north. Ironically, it's this final deployment that finally made the rulers of Rondon think that Lagarde was too much of a risk for them to ignore him and let him pursue his goals in control of his mercenary band. Thus, the Kingdom of Rondon attacked the Knights of the Midnight Sun, whom they had so often contracted into mercenary work previously. Darcy and Lagarde fought hard and bravely, but eventually the mercenary band was overpowered by the larger army of Rondon. The guard is captured, and it is decided that an example must be made of him. He was sent to a place reserved for those that truly invoked the anger of the Rondon ruling class. A place that was hoped would lead to him being forgotten in the waves of time. They sent him to the dungeon of fear and hunger. Like Icarus, Lagarde had flown a little too close to the sun and angered the powers that be of the kingdom. 
which led to him being arrested and thrown into the deepest, darkest dungeon in the kingdom. The prophesized one, already while still alive. There are many tales written and sung about his tale. We don't know where the prophecy got started, but needless to say that it's all fallacy. But the man himself is a curious kind. There is definitely something different about him and whatever his part might be in the greater scheme of things. At the very least, he started something larger. The new gods of Badlegard. Kahara the mercenary, Enki the dark priest, Darcy the knight, and Ragv the outlander descend into the dungeon to find Lagard, only to discover that they have been led there for reasons unknown to them. Lagard has staged the entire situation, his capture and the four rescuers, so that he would end up in the bottom level of the dungeon with people capable to help him complete his expedition. Lagard knew the dungeon's greatest secrets and the reasons the dungeon had descended into a storm of violence and miasma. You see, there was a door, a special door, at the very bottom of the dungeon that only opened to the holder of a very special cube. A cube that Lagarde had destroyed Rag's hometown to steal. Behind this ancient door waited the ancient city of Mahabre, the city of gods. Mahabre was the ancient city where the Fellowship had traveled to in the year 800. A full 600 years before the events of Fear and Hunger 1, and over a thousand years before the Festival of Termina in Part 2. An ancient city that still held traces of the new and old gods that existed on its own in space and time. It felt like a city that should not be able to exist, at least not this far underground. See, in the world of Fear and Hunger, it is possible for mere humans to rise to be gods, or so they thought. And it was in, in Mahabre where they would come with their aspirations of godhood, and Lagarde was the most recent in that tradition. He had engineered all this just to get himself closer to the ancient city and allow himself ascension to godhood. He told himself that the ends of merit the means, as long as he got more power. But it was for a good cause, he told himself, maybe honestly, maybe naively, that if he were able to ascend and become a god, he'd be able to bring order and stability to the people in the land, and thus lessen their suffering. It always seems to start with the best of intentions, doesn't it? Lagarde, like the new gods and the fellowship before him, also wanted to ascend to godhood, in order to rival the power of the old gods. While the new gods were humans that had touched the powers of the gods and had ascended, the old gods were different. They were not born in this world. They were part of the very fabric of existence. Creation, destruction, nature, the depths, and rare, the trickster moon god. They each represented basic concepts of existence. They also represented it, the targets of the ire of humanity for all the plagues, famines, disaster, tragedies, and wars that humanity had had to endure. Since the beginning of time, humans have been trying to find a way to end the chaos and bring order and take the power away from the gods to gain control over chaos. One of the new gods, a member of the Fellowship, was also working on a secret scheme, another avenue of attack against the old gods. Sired by Lagarde, she would birth another ancient one and give rise to a new god, one that might be able to stand against the old ones, the god of fear and hunger. A soul that radiates the light of an older god. The soul has formed itself inside the body of a little girl. The mother of the ancient one is the endless one, and the father is the man from the prophecies. The result of such an unholy union are unfamiliar to us. The new gods, when asked about the ancient one, one of the possible endings of Fear Hunger 1 sees the birth and ascension of this new god, born of Lagarde and Novian, and carrying the ancient soul. The birth of the god of fear and hunger marked a new era for humanity, the beginning of the cruel age. After his resurrection by Darcy and the birth of the god of fear and hunger, Lagarde would wander the earth, preparing his next chance to strike at the old gods, resurfacing hundreds of years later as the Kaiser of the Bremen nation. We encounter the Kaiser, Lagarde, sitting by himself in a dark room. The birth of a new god, he says. The logic, the machine god, is online. Marina replies that she's here to take him down. Many have come for me, is the Kaiser's response as he stands up. If you wish to challenge me, I won't deny you the honor. Prepare yourself. The encounter with the Kaiser starts. He is accompanied by a snake and his asterisk, much like the encounter with him in part one. Marina's first black smog has little effect. 
Then we use the condensed hemlock on the Kaiser as Nazra's head reflects a spell onto the asterisk. Fortunately, a combination of the hemlock's damage and the attacks with the red virtue ends the encounter with the Kaiser fairly quickly. The guard disintegrates where he stood as Marina goes through the only visible door into the white womb of the logic, where what remains of Rayla is now becoming the machine god, the logic. We see her new and final form as she's surrounded by the blue moths that have been leading us here. The machine god activates. The battle against the machine god will be a two-phased battle. In the first one, we find Rayla in a red chrysalid standing on top of what appears to be an engine with six exhaust ports. I tried to use the Condemns Hemlock on the Machine God, but she is immune to it. The Logic will attack with the Red Arc spell, and every now and then, the exhaust system will activate, and the six exhaust ports will light up in red. Each exhaust port will need to be attacked in order to prevent the exhaust system from attacking us and doing damage. Fortunately, the Black Smog spell will hit all targets on the field. So in one turn, I can disable all six of the exhaust ports, preventing the Machine God from using the exhaust attack. And on turns when I'm not dealing with the exhaust, I focus damage on the Machine God. The theme of Mahabra starts playing in the music. It's the theme of the city where gods are born. The Leechmonger Ring's ability to steal life becomes extremely useful here, coupled with Marina's high damage output. It will continually heal Marina back to full health as she attacks the logic. This pattern repeats over and over again as Marina gradually whittles down the logic's health. Every now and then, we'll use an extra turn to heal Marina back up to full health. After a number of turns, we see the logic transform into his second form. The logic changes form and the hand of destruction and the hand of creation appear. Marina concentrates her damage first on the hand of creation since it can heal. The hand of destruction is capable of casting hurting which has a chance of dismembering you. Fortunately, using the fluted armor Marina's limbs are protected. The Machine God casts Moth Swarm on us, but the spell is reflected back on her, saving us the damage and hurting her instead. After a few more attacks, the first of two hands goes down, so I won't have to worry about the hurting spell anymore. Although the first phase is invulnerable to poison and won't be hurt by the hemlock, the second phase of the logic is vulnerable to the condensed hemlock, causing over 4,000 damage per turn.
after a few more turns, enough damage is dealt to the logic. And we see the rise of a new god as the machine god's chrysalid opens up, revealing a green hue on the inside. The conscience of consensus. Just an avatar for the stream of thought. Join me in the promised land, says the machine god. Marina is absorbed into this new virtual reality created by the machine god in a desperate attempt to be able to wrestle control of humanity's reality away from the influence of the old gods and placing it in humanity's hands. In the artificial green, warmth surrounds your body. It feels like you've been floating in nothingness. Empathy and hope fill you from inside out. You've gone through enough. Now you can rest. Just close your eyes and let the warm waves wash you away. Ending A, The Machine God. But what if Marina didn't want to sacrifice her life in the White Bunker and instead decided to go up against Rare and try to escape this hellish festival? So now, let's see how things would have played out if we had gone for ending B. Going into the Moon Tower and fighting the Feathered Jester and the Moon God. Let's see what's the current state of things. 10 participants down, 4 remain. Marina, Caligura, August, and Marco. Let's fast forward time to the night of day 3. If we're going to hunt down the remaining participants, it'd be more fun if they're moon scorched. On the night of day 3, Marina makes her way back to the White Mode Apartments. We'll have to go to the otherworldly version of the apartments in order to encounter Marco's moon scorched form, the giant. We get our first glimpse of the giant through the bars that convert these apartments into prison cells. Climbing up one more level, we come face to face with the giant. Marina summons a blood golem to help her in the fight. And the head of the giant, uh, grows? Marina casts pheromones on the blood golem so that the blood golem will be the target of the giant's rage and his attacks. Fortunately, Marina is able to disable the giant's throwing arm in one turn with her four attacks with the Red Virtue. After a few more turns, we do enough damage to the giant's head to take him down. With Marco down, that only leaves August and Caligara. But August um, sees himself out of this world before becoming a monster. So that only leaves Caligara whose moon-scorched form can be found in the sewers, where he belongs. After walking around in the sewers for a little bit, Monster, Caligara's moon-scorched form, attacks us. Marina opens the attack with the Black Smog spell, since it will hurt all of his limbs. He really doesn't have too much health, so I just have Marina focus all her attacks on the center mass or the torso 
trying to end the fight quickly. Monster, true to Caligura's nature, uses vomit as a foul way of attacking you. He will also use his multiple hands to physically attack using a skill called Hanky Panky. Fortunately, Marina very quickly cuts her way through his health. She has absorbed the decrepit soul, and she throws up because of her nausea. With the 13 other participants down, the path to Rare via the Moon Tower in the center of town is now unlocked. Marina makes her way past all the impaled villagers. Marina feels dizzy being this close to the monolith. Her sight becomes blurry and she can hear the blood rush in her veins. For this fight, I'll be using the Death Mask, Fluted Armor, a Tell Stone, Leech Monger Ring, and a Shack Shack. And I tank out the Ghoul with Magic Resistance and Spell Reflection. A large stone door stands tall before you. Your heart beats loud as a drum just by being so close to the tower. Adrenaline is rushing through you. You cannot explain this feeling. You are at the same time terrified and tempted to touch the intricate ornaments of the ancient stone slab door. You feel energy flowing to the door through your fingertips. You feel euphoric. The stone slab doors open. The hollow tower rises up to dizzying heights. The elevator, with the sigil of rare embedded on it, activates when Marina steps on it, taking her up to the top. Hercule greets you in a monotonous voice. Congratulations, you are the last one standing. You managed to excel where others have failed. It is truly a remarkable feat, a Herculean effort. You are the champion of Termina, the festival to end all festivals. Marina says that she didn't do any of this for the festival. To which the fettered jester replies that he doesn't like Marina's attitude. He says that no matter, Marina is still entitled to her price or did he say prize? A peak to grandeur and a chance to reach for the illustrious heights. Your bloodlust knows no end. If that's truly your wish, go ahead. The moon god is waiting there, looming high in the sky. Swing away with your sword. And so combat initializes with a servant of rare. I initially focus all attacks on his right arm in order to try to stop him from casting his meteorite spells. Fortunately, on the second attack, we disable his spell casting arm. Marina then goes for the Feather Jester's other wing so that he can't use it to defend himself. But we're not quick enough. He is able to get the wing up in a defensive position. Since his wing is actively guarding, any attacks on his torso will be reflected. So I need to take out his second wing first before being able to damage his torso. Fortunately, the Blood Golem lands a very opportune critical hit. Marina focuses her attacks on Percola's torso. Percola is still a threat, but much less now that he can't cast spells. I could have used a Hemlock on him, but I wanted to beat him fair and square. We see another instance of Nazra's head reflecting a spell back onto the caster as the ghoul reflects the hurting spell back on Percola. 
Marina delivers one more soul strike and Perkele goes down. Impressive, very impressive indeed, says the moon jester. But what do you think happens next? This is what you wanted, right? The bells chime. It feels like something unnatural is about to happen. Hear that? He's coming. Time for you to wake up. The bells are tolling for you, Marina. The traces of the trickster moon god, the old god rare, focuses on the moon tower and keenly on Marina. A transient light embraces you as the encounter with the moon god rare starts. Marina summons a blood golem to help her in her fight. Rare is surrounded by two rings filled with eyes, eyes that will continually drain Marina's sanity during the fight. Rare himself will be casting attacks and spells to inflict direct physical damage on our party. Fortunately, Marina's high armor negates some of the damage. Using the fluted armor prevents limb loss, which would be catastrophic since then Marina wouldn't be able to wield her sword. Having the Battel Ring equipped makes sure our sanity doesn't drop to zero. Another powerful combination that Marina is using here is the Leechmonger Ring and having high damage. That allows Marina to recover a significant part of her health while still damaging Rare. The Lunar Storm spell deals a lot of damage to Marina, so we have to take a few turns to heal. Slowly but surely, Marina whittles down Rare's HP, ending the fight as the traces of Rare loses interest in having to deal with petty humans. The moon god grew disinterested in you and slowly drifted away. You've become witness to something beyond your comprehension. You've seen something you shouldn't have. As you slowly regain your consciousness, you realize you're not the same person as you were still just a brief moment ago. Marina wakes up to a new reality. Suddenly, the dark void above feels that much larger almost infinite. There are things in this world beyond your understanding, beyond human understanding. You're not sure if this feeling is enlightenment or that of total terror. The gentle wind on your cheek feels almost alien. With this newly acquired understanding, even the most minor sensations have this altered nuance to them. The moonlight tainted your existence. But at least you survive with your mind somewhat intact. Ending B. 
Day four. The only soul that returned from the trip was you. You didn't have any burdens left from your old life. It was a bittersweet feeling. Your ties to your family and past were severed thanks to the traumatic events that transpired in Preheville. The thought of returning to Vatican City to continue your studies didn't sound appealing, not after everything you had seen. Some things were not meant for humans to meddle with. As years went on, you drifted all the way to the country of Wallen and found yourself settling down at the red light districts of the capital. You had trouble fitting in with regular people who were unaware of the greater scheme of things. But from the people that inhabited the red light districts, you found kindred spirits. Everyone carried baggage and judged no one. Occult skills helped you make friends easily, and there were many ways you could make a living there with the help of a little magic. Things were pretty nice, actually. Now, if you could only tell who this photobombing person was, she had been trying to make friends with you for the longest time. Pretty annoying. And finally, Marina's journey in Preheville during the Festival of Termina comes to an end. By now, you've heard me speak for about four hours, so I want to say thank you very much. I do appreciate your time. Any comments or likes are a big help with the algorithm. If you'd like to stay up to date with what I'm working on, feel free to join my Discord server. The link will be in the comments. I'm always looking for people to give me feedback and opinions on what I could be working on next. I hope I was able to bring something positive or at least entertaining into your day with this video. And I hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. Take care, be well, and later. Don't you dare go hollow.